water. It would make our job a whole lot easier, if not do us out of a job altogether. Ulf laughed. You could suggest it. The press would be grateful to you on a slow news day. The commissioner winced at the mention of the press. Actually, that brings me back to the question of my cousin. One of the reasons why I asked to see you is my worries about the press. We have to be so careful, you know. The slightest thing and they're off. Discretion is required. He looked searchingly at Ulf. I've heard that the Department of Sensitive Crimes is known for its discretion. Ulf assured him that he knew all about confidentiality. It's our stock in trade, sir. Felix? Yes, Felix. We're ultra-discreet. Not even any pillow talk. Nothing. The commissioner said that that was what he liked to hear. You see, Ulf, he went on, I need somebody to find out why somebody seems intent on ruining my cousin's business. Ulf raised an eyebrow. He had not expected to be asked to do a personal favor, something unofficial. There were rules about that, and he would have thought that the commissioner, of all people, should know about those. His doubts were anticipated. Oh, no, I'm not asking you to do something on the side, said the commissioner. This will be a perfectly proper criminal investigation. The crime being, asked Ulf. The crime, I suspect, is malicious interference in trade. That's in the penal code section, whatever it is. I forget the numbers of these things. If you maliciously set out to interfere improperly in my business, you commit a crime. That makes it a matter for the police. Ulf said that he understood. And it's sensitive because the local police have proved to be hopeless at dealing with it. They say there are no grounds for suspicion that a crime has been committed. The commissioner paused. Now, I could instruct them to investigate more thoroughly. I could overrule them. But the problem with that is that if I did so, and it got out that I was doing it to help a cousin, I'd be accused of exercising improper influence for a personal reason. You see my difficulty? Ulf said that he did. I'll take care of it, he said. Leave it with me. Just give me the address of the spa, and I'll handle the whole thing. The commissioner arose from his seat. I'm very grateful, Ulf. And report to me, will you, if, when, you find something. They shook hands, and the commissioner began to show Ulf out of his office. What was the name of that stuff they're giving your dog? he asked. Clomipramine. Interesting, said the commissioner. Do you think it works on cats? Possibly, said Ulf. I don't really know, though. Because we have a cat as well as a dog, said the commissioner. The cat belongs to my wife. I'm not really a cat person, you see. But the cat is very difficult. Antisocial, in fact. It takes a swipe at you from under a chair as you walk past. Draws blood sometimes. You could try said Ulf. But sometimes cats just have nasty natures, don't you think? And you can't do much about a personality disorder. Cats are psychopaths at heart. The commissioner looked disappointed. How long do cats tend to live? They can last for a long time, said Ulf. Twenty years in some cases. The commissioner sighed. We all have our burdens in this life, don't we? Yes, said Ulf. They shook hands again, and Ulf left the office. When he returned to his own desk, the email from the commissioner's assistant had already arrived, giving the name of the spa, its address, and a telephone number to call if he needed directions to find it. It was almost lunchtime when Ulf returned to the office. Carl had already left to eat his sandwich lunch in a nearby park. 
while Eric, taking his lunch at his desk, was paging through an angling magazine. You survived, said Anna, as Ulf walked into the room. Eric looked up from his magazine. Does he really exist? Ulf smiled. Yes, I survived, and he does exist. He's charming, in fact. Polite, interested, everything you'd want a police commissioner to be. Anna was eager to hear the details. What did he want? Are you getting a promotion? Are we getting promotions? Or early retirement, added Eric. No, said Ulf. Nothing was said about that. So, pressed Anna, why did he get you over there? Ulf crossed to his desk. I'm sorry, he said. I can't talk about it. Anna and Eric both stared at him in incomprehension. But we are colleagues, said Anna. We tell one another what's going on. Otherwise, she shrugged her shoulders in a way that implied the collapse of sensitive crime work in Malmö, perhaps in all southern Sweden. Yes, said Eric. There are no secrets here. Ulf was not to be swayed. I gave the commissioner my word that I would not discuss the case with anybody. Sorry, but that means you. Anna shrugged. Very well, if that's the way it's to be. I really am sorry, explained Ulf. I'd love to tell you, but I just can't. Put yourself in my position. You do exactly the same. Ulf's appeal had its effect. Mollified, Anna suggested that they go for lunch in the café together, where she would tell him about the latest developments in the Singener Mangenusson case. Something odd has been going on, she said, as they prepared to leave the office. I don't know what it is, but it's definitely fishy. Eric glanced up, but then returned to his magazine. There's been something odd about it from the beginning, agreed Ulf. In the café across the road, there was no table at the window, and they were obliged to seat themselves at the back. A straggling group of students, noisy and bound up in themselves, had taken the best places and were drowning out conversation at neighboring tables with their laughter. Ulf looked at them with an air of slight regret. Were we like that? he asked. Anna glanced up from her scanning of the menu. Yes, I think we were. Nothing changes, really. And yet, said Ulf, when you're at that stage, you have no idea that you yourself will change, have you? When you're twenty, you can't imagine your forty-year-old self. What's that English poem? Anna mused. Gather ye rosebuds while you may. Old time is still a-flying. She was impressed. I didn't think you knew much poetry. I don't, said Ulf. We were made to learn poetry at school. I rather enjoyed it. Others didn't. Strindberg, Eric Axel Karlfeldt, some German poets too, some Shakespeare. Some of it stuck, but not much. He remembered something. Oh, yes. Homer. We read Homer. In Greek? she asked. No, Swedish. Homer sounds rather good in Swedish. It could be an old Norse saga if you change the names. Lagerlöf's translation. I remember thinking of the Odyssey as taking place in the Stockholm archipelago. At that age, I couldn't really imagine Greece. He paused as he looked down at the menu. Tell me about Singine. Bring me up to date. Anna leaned forward. There was a woman at the table next to them who had been eavesdropping on their conversation about poetry, so she lowered her voice as she spoke. Right. She was reported missing five days ago. A young woman by the name of Linnea Eck, a student at the university, reported to the local police that her friend had failed to turn up for a meeting. They were both something to do with the university's amateur dramatic club, and the meeting had been set up for some time. It was an important meeting, apparently, and she thought it most unlike her friend not to show up. 
She tried calling her on her mobile to no avail. The phone was switched off and still is. Then she tried her parents, but they're in Japan, apparently. We've been in touch with them subsequently. They're very anxious, as you can imagine. They could throw no light on the matter. Ulf asked about Singina's other friends, and, in particular, Beam. I spoke to her, said Anna. She was worried at first that I was coming to raise the matter of her own recent behavior. But she relaxed a bit when she realized that this had nothing to do with that. She said she thought it most unlike Singina to go off without telling anybody. Apparently, she reports her movements obsessively on social media. You can effectively track her from her online posts. And have there been any? asked Ulf. Anna said there had not. That's the most worrying thing, she said. But listen to this. Several hours after my interview with Linnea Eck, she called me back and said that she had been thinking about it all and had an idea that she wanted to run past me. Actually, the idea was a suspicion. When she told me, she looked rather worried. She said that it had suddenly occurred to her that Beam might know more about the matter than she was letting on. She said that Beam and Singina had had a major falling out over Singina's coming to us to report on the disappearance of that imaginary boyfriend. Beam believed that Singina had stolen that selfie from her and was not ready to forgive her for it. She more or less suggested that Beam had killed Singina in some unknown place and in some unspecified way. Ulf snorted. Unlikely. A little dispute amongst a few imaginative young women. This doesn't smell of homicide. Yes, said Anna, but there's something else. Linnea said that on the day Singina disappeared, she had received a text from Beam saying they had to meet. That was just before the amateur dramatic meeting that she didn't turn up to. How did Linnea know that? asked Ulf. Singina texted her. And where were they to meet? asked Ulf. Singina didn't say. Ulf thought for a moment. And Beam? What does she say about that meeting? Anna leaned even further forward. The woman at the next table had inclined her head slightly to be able to hear better. Here's another interesting thing. Beam denies all knowledge of the meeting with Singina. She flatly denies it. Ulf groaned. Lies, he said. Somebody's lying. Anna agreed. Yes, but who? This seems to be one of those cases where you have A saying X and B saying Y. I like it when you're algebraic, said Ulf, and immediately regretted it. It was a flirtatious remark. Describing somebody as algebraic was undoubtedly to cross a line. You would not normally describe an ordinary friend as algebraic and then say that you liked her that way. He saw the effect on Anna, and his regret deepened. Algebraic? she said, half coyly. Well, I'm very happy to enter into any equation. Ulf floundered in his attempt to extricate himself. I wasn't being personal, Anna. I was simply referring to your use of symbols. He paused and then added, That's all, really. Just that. Nothing else. He put an emphasis on the words nothing else that they would normally not have had. They were not an afterthought. They were the thought itself. She was looking at him intently. I thought you said you liked me. I thought that was what you meant. But of course I like you. I wouldn't be having lunch with you if I didn't like you. Algebra has got nothing to do with it. She lowered her eyes to the menu, and he saw that she was blushing. 
There was nothing he could do about that. She had picked up his message of disengagement, if that was the message, and he was not sure about that. It was geometry rather than algebra. The geometry of this situation was wrong. There was a triangle with Yo and Anna as two points of the diagram and himself as the third. He did not want to be involved in that sort of arrangement because it was a triangle that had ended his marriage, an involuntary triangle, and he did not want a repetition. Anna was married. It was as simple as that. He could not become responsible for jeopardizing a marriage. She looked up. Ulf, she blurted out. I value your friendship. You know that. His reply was measured. Of course. But I do think, I've always thought, that we should keep our friendship as just that. A professional one. He caught his breath. This was not what he had expected. After her remark about equations, which surely was pretty unambiguous, he thought that it would be for him to put the brakes on the situation. But now she was acting as the one who was intent on calling a halt. Was that to save face? He knew what he had to do. Ulf was gentlemanly, and he knew that a gentleman in these circumstances would assume the role of the proposer and would apologize and take a step back. That was what a gentleman would do. And although he knew that nobody talked about being a gentleman anymore, the concept still existed and was waiting to be rediscovered. Perhaps it had just been renamed and was still operating somewhere under the burden of the new language of relationships, the language that stressed self-determination and personal space. That was not all that different from the code of gentlemanly conduct that had previously prevented men from inappropriate conduct in their relations with women. The things that men were now supposed not to do were precisely the things that gentlemen were not meant to do anyway. So what was the difference? Were we simply becoming old-fashioned again, as societies tended to do when they saw the consequences of tearing up the behavioral rule book? Ulf had never reflected on where his values came from, but had he done so, the answer would have been obvious. His father, Ture Varje, had been the doorman of a famous old-fashioned hotel. He was a self-taught man who spent his spare time reading in an effort to make up for the education that family misfortune had prevented him from getting. He was well known to the hotel's clientele and in the wider city, much appreciated for his courtesy and charm, in his professional role, he wore a stovepipe hat that he doffed to all who entered. He wore grey kid leather gloves and a long frock coat on which two small military medals were pinned. He sang in a choir that performed Swedish folk songs. He never spoke harshly or rudely to anyone. That was where Ulf came from. And now, intuitively and automatically, he knew what his father would do. I'm very sorry, he said. I spoke out of turn. Forgive me. It was my fault entirely. I was forgetting that some things simply cannot be, no matter how much one might wish otherwise. Anna seemed to recover remarkably quickly. It was a relief to her. He thought, of course, she said, and then repeated, of course. Ulf pointed to the menu. What are you going to have? Anna pointed to an item at the top of the handwritten menu. Although describing itself as a cafe, and although much of its business was in the serving of coffee to office workers, 
This was really a bistro with a carefully prepared, if small, selection of classic dishes. Jansson's Temptation, she said. When did you last have that? Ten years ago? Ulf licked his lips. I loved that. My mother sometimes made it on a Sunday evening. It was a simple dish, consisting of onions, potatoes, anchovies, and cream. It was echt comfort food. Or gubrer, Anna said, pointing to another item. Both, said Ulf, with delicious irresponsibility. Jansson's temptation first, and then gubrer. The waitress came to take their order. As regulars, they both knew her, and they listened as she complained about the students. You know what I'd like to say to them, she said. I'd like to go up to them and say, what gives you the right to sit about in cafes laughing your heads off when other people have to go to work? Do you know how long they'll stay in here? Three hours at least. And the government pays them to study, doesn't it? They get all that money to sit about in cafes and make a din. Would you like us to arrest them? asked Varya. We could, you know, for sitting about. It's there, somewhere, in the penal code. The waitress laughed. Somebody will believe you one of these days, Mr. Varya. Their order placed, Ulf steered the conversation back to Signe. Why was the matter referred to us? he asked. A missing student, and they usually turn up. Is hardly a sensitive crime. Her father's a diplomat, explained Anna. He's the Swedish representative on a number of anti-terrorism initiatives. Hence, Ulf raised a hand. Enough said. Although I don't think this has anything to do with terrorism. No? Anna glanced at the woman at the next table, who had now given up her attempt to listen to their conversation. A reproachful glance came in return. I think, Anna continued, that this has nothing to do with anything political and everything to do with some silly goings-on between three young women. Boys are probably involved somewhere in the background, especially after that ridiculous business of the imaginary boyfriend. Hormones come into it, I think. Don't they always? said Varya. Possibly. Anyway, I don't think that Singina has been the victim of anything. She hasn't been kidnapped or murdered. She's probably just gone off in a huff because of a row with her friend Beam, or ex-friend, I should say. Ulf fiddled with the menu. So, this is all just collateral damage resulting from a bust-up between Singina and Beam? Anna nodded. Yes. So, what do we do now? Anna spread her hands. It was a gesture of defeat in the face of uncertainty. Heaven knows, she said. Chapter 12 Being Swedish is not always easy. On his return to the office, Ulf was told by Eric that Bloomquist had telephoned him and wanted him to return the call. As he sat down to dial the number, Ulf felt the effect of the Jansson's temptation, the lingering taste of anchovies, always given to repeat itself, was accompanied by a heaviness in the stomach that, although not unpleasant, was hardly conducive to work. He would have liked a siesta. He would have liked to stretch out on a sofa and think about anything other than a telephone call to Bloomquist. Bloomquist answered quickly. You aren't busy, are you? Ulf resented this. There was a widespread belief in the police force that those in special offices, such as the Department of Sensitive Crimes, occupied virtual sinecures with very little to do. He could not help himself and replied snappily, fairly busy. He added, as always, which was not true, of course, but seemed merited in the circumstances. 
He could, of course, tell Bloomquist that he was preparing for a major case assigned to him by no less a person than the commissioner, but confidentiality prevented that. And it was also true that he did not have much preparation to do, but that was irrelevant. The point was that Bloomquist had no business insinuating that the Department of Sensitive Crimes was underemployed. Bloomquist revealed what he wanted. He had been, he said, on regular duty on the street when he had been approached by Hampus Johansson. You'll remember him, won't you? The man who stabbed Malte Gustafsson? I gave you the information, and Ulf cut him short. He had anticipated that Bloomquist would take the credit for Johansson's arrest. But, in fact, it was he, Ulf, who had had the idea in the first place that the crime had been committed by somebody of short stature. But he was not going to get involved in an argument with Bloomquist about that. So he simply replied, Yes, your response to my initial query was very helpful, Bloomquist. And before Bloomquist could say anything else about who had done what in bringing Humpus to justice, he added, What does he want? He wants to see you. He's very, well, I suppose you'd describe him as distraught. Ulf sighed. We can't reverse convictions. We're not a court of appeal. Bloomquist said that it was nothing to do with the conviction. It's the sentence, Mr. Varia, his community service sentence. But that's the court's affair said Ulf. We don't decide who has to do what. You must know that, Bloomquist. It's very difficult for him, Mr. Varia. He feels you're the only one who can help. He has a lot of respect for you, you see. Ulf looked up at the ceiling. He had felt sorry for Humpus. Everybody in that courtroom had felt that way. And... He was a kind man, possibly the kindest man in the entire Swedish police service, and he found it difficult to refuse a heartfelt request, such as this obviously was. Yet at the same time, there were limits to what you could do. The world was a place of sadness and strife, of selfish behavior and disagreement, of oppression and injustice, and efforts to remedy that to set right the scales of justice, sometimes seemed like patching up a crack in a dam wall with sticking plaster. But you had to do what you could, and more specifically, what your role in life expected of you. And he was a detective. He was a member of the Malmö Criminal Investigation Authority, and that meant there were souls within his care. Yes, he thought souls, because that old-fashioned word said so much more than the word person. A soul was something more than that. A soul had feelings and ambitions and private tragedies. A soul weighed more than something that was not a soul. These thoughts were a reminder of duty of what he had to do simply because he was Ulf Varia. Of course, I'll see him, Bloomquist, he said at last. And thank you again for what you did in that case. We couldn't have solved it without you. Bloomquist's pleasure was evident down the telephone line. Anything I can do, Mr. Varia, anything, anytime. And then he added, I know how busy you people are. The conversation ended with the arrangements. Bloomquist would come to the office within the next half hour, and they would drive together in the Saab to the dance studio where Humpus taught. As Ulf hung up, he pictured the studio where that extraordinary meeting with Humpus had taken place. He saw the revolving mirror ball, that cheap dispenser of glittery light that seemed de rigueur in those tawdry dance places. He saw the sprung floor with its pliant boards and its dusting of French chalk. French chalk. French chalk. 
For some reason this resonated with him, but he could not remember why. Hampus was playing the piano when they arrived. Two couples were on the dance floor, two instructors with their clients. The instructors were women, the clients two middle-aged men, one in a loose-fitting white suit, the other wearing jeans and a seersucker jacket. Hampus, who did not see them arrive, was perched on a piano stool, his legs far from touching the floor or the pedals of the piano. His limited reach meant that he had to twist from this side to that as the music ascended or descended. The instructors noticed them enter but continued dancing. One was counting out loud to her pupil as she guided him through the steps. The other was demonstrating the correct position of the arms as she moved the man in the seersucker jacket through the steps. Bloomquist beamed with pleasure as he watched the dance, tapping a foot against the floor in time to the music. I just love dancing, he whispered to Ulf. My wife and I go out dancing whenever we can. We dance a lot. Ulf nodded. Yes, he said. Letter had been keen on dancing, he less so. Our daughter's turning into quite a good little dancer, he said. Ballet, though, not ballroom. Wolf smiled. Very nice, he said. You know there's a ballet school up in Stockholm? Wolf watched the dancers. Bloomquist talked too much, he thought. He really did. What was wrong with silence? I've heard of it. The Royal Swedish Ballet School. They take quite young children, I believe. We couldn't send Svea up there just yet. She's only eight, you know. Eight's too young, don't you think? You can't make up your mind about a career, and ballet really is a career if you're eight. The pace of music increased. Hump was twisting from side to side more energetically now to reach the higher or lower notes. The floor creaked as the dancers moved. Ulf saw the French chalk, a thin white layer on the wood, striated by the dancers' feet. I went to ballet lessons myself when I was a boy, said Bloomquist. Just for a year or two, I gave them up because I was being teased. Ulf glanced at him. I can't quite see it, Bloomquist. Bloomquist grinned. Oh, I think I was quite good, Mr. Varia. Perhaps I could have continued. I might have become a professional ballet dancer rather than a policeman. He paused as if imagining the contrast. Life's odd, isn't it? You make a decision that could dictate the whole course of your life, and you don't know at the time that it will do that, do you? You don't. No, I suppose you don't. You never did ballet, Mr. Varia? No, Bloomquist, I never did ballet. You might have been quite good, you know. Some surprising people are quite good at ballet. Humpus was reaching the end of the tune. With a final flourish, he concluded, and then closed the piano lid with a bang. The man in the seersucker jacket said, Ah! loudly, an exclamation of satisfaction. His instructor patted him on the shoulder in congratulation, a dance well danced. Hampus turned around and saw Ulf and Bloomquist. Slipping off his stool, he walked quickly across the floor and shook hands with Ulf. Thank you for coming, Mr. Varia, he said. I hope you haven't been waiting too long. I enjoyed watching, Ulf replied, and you're a fine pianist, Mr. Johansson. Hampus made a self-effacing gesture. No, I'm not really, Mr. Varia. I play very functionally. I see that you can't reach the pedals, Bloomquist observed. That can't help. Ulf glanced at Bloomquist. Hampus frowned and then rubbed his hands together as if to restore the circulation. Couldn't you have some device to extend the pedals? Bloomquist went on. Some sort of lever device? Hampus stared fixedly at the floor. I don't know. Maybe. You wanted to see me, said Ulf. Yes, said Hampus. 
I was going to go to your office. I didn't expect you to come down here, but Mr. Bloomquist told me that you didn't have much to do and wouldn't mind. Ulf glanced at Bloomquist again, who looked away, lifting his gaze to the static mirror ball. I see. He looked again at Bloomquist. He was unrepentant, he noticed. Sometimes it was difficult to be as tolerant as he wanted to be. But then, thought Ulf, the whole point about high ideals is that they are high. Being Swedish was not always easy, but you had to do your best and hope that you didn't slip and become, well, Mediterranean in outlook. It was so easy, such a beguiling option to shrug your shoulders and behave as your immediate emotions dictated. And how comfortable it must be to sit in the sun and smile and say the world will look after itself and that its problems will resolve themselves tomorrow or even the day after that. Ulf became businesslike. Well, here I am, Mr. Johansson. What's the trouble? Mr. Bloomquist tells me you're not happy with your community service arrangements. Humpus nodded. Certainly not. Very unhappy. Ulf spread his hands in a gesture of acceptance. But that's the whole point about a court sentence, you know. The people who get it are usually not very happy. In fact, some of them are downright unhappy. That's what I said, Bloomquist interjected. Ulf asked Hampus what his assignment was. I've been assigned to work at an army base, said Hampus. I was told that I would be given general duties eight hours a week. Ulf said he thought that sounded reasonable enough. Some people doing community service get very unpleasant tasks, you know. General duties in an army base did not sound too onerous to him. Hampus looked at Ulf defiantly. This is, this is very onerous. Tell me, then, Ulf said. What do they make you do? Carry heavy things? Peel potatoes in the cookhouse? Potatoes are best eaten unpeeled, interjected Bloomquist. The skins contain a lot of the real nutritional material, you know. You shouldn't peel potatoes. Ulf threw Bloomquist a dismissive glance. I know that, Bloomquist, he said, but does the army? You'd think they would know by now, Mr. Varia. The army should keep up to date with these things. Soldiers need a balanced diet, just the same as everybody else. Ulf turned back to Hampus. So what do they make you do, then? Hampus hesitated. They haven't told me yet, he answered. Ulf frowned. He was beginning to feel irritated by Hampus. The dance instructor was lucky to have been let off so lightly by the court. He could easily have ended up in prison, and it ill became him now to complain about his community service assignment. What was wrong with being allocated to an army barracks? A pickpocket of Ulf's acquaintance a habitual thief whom Ulf had arrested on several occasions during his early days in the police, had recently been given one hundred hours of general duties in the sewage works, and another, a public drunkard and indecent exhibitionist, had been sentenced to fifty hours of cleaning up at the fish market, a malodorous job involving the disposal of rotten fish heads, the army would be nothing like that. So how do you know you won't like it? asked Ulf. Because I was warned about it, said Hampus. Somebody who comes for dance lessons is married to one of the sergeant majors up there. He told her that they've planned something very unpleasant for me. He didn't tell her what it was, but he said he would never do it himself, even if they offered to promote him. Ulf sighed. That's not enough, he said. That doesn't give me grounds to interfere. Hampus looked at him imploringly. He said, I might not survive. That's what he said. 
Ulf raised an eyebrow. This was different. Was the army planning to use Humpus on some sort of dangerous combat mission? You mean that you might be obliged to fight? he asked. Humpus nodded. That's what it looks like. Ulf glanced at his colleague, who shrugged. They're short of men, Blumquist said. Maybe it's their way of recruiting. They get community service people. That's ridiculous, retorted Ulf. Absurd. Defense spending cuts, ventured Blumquist. Ulf looked at Humpus, who was staring back at him, waiting for his response. He trusts me, thought Ulf. He expects me to protect him. And at that point, the urge that had prompted Ulf to join the police all those years ago once again tugged at his heart. If there was an injustice or an abuse of power, then he felt compelled to set it right. And there was an abuse of power here, a major one, perhaps, and he would not dodge it. Ulf found himself thinking of what he would do. He knew that one could go back to the court and get a community service order varied, but that this could take time. The last time he had been involved in that particular procedure, it had taken two months. Hampus did not have two months. He might not even have two days. It was almost unbelievable that the army should behave in this way in the 21st century. If they wanted to take risks with their own men, that was their affair, although he imagined that they were careful to train them properly. But to take a complete outsider and put him into combat was breathtakingly irresponsible. Humpus was now looking imploringly at Ulf. Could you speak to the colonel? he pleaded. Ask him not to make me do whatever they've been planning. I'll do anything, anything that a civilian can do. Even peel potatoes, gladly. You shouldn't, said Bloomquist. There are minerals in potato skins. It's pointless to get rid of the best part of Ulf, interrupted him. I think you have a very strong case, he said. So you'll do it? asked Humpus eagerly. Whatever they have in mind, Ulf said, sounds unacceptable. I'll go to the base and insist on seeing the colonel. Good, said Humpus. Thank you. And if he won't deal with it immediately, Ulf continued, I shall speak to the commissioner of police and ask him to intervene. He paused. I know him, you see. Blumquist looked sharply at Ulf. You know him? You know Alberia? Ulf did his best to sound casual. As it happens, I do. Wow! exclaimed Blumquist, and then, his voice dropping, he added, What's he like? Very pleasant, actually, Ulf replied. Felix is... Bloomquist's eyebrows shot up. Felix? You know his first name? Ulf's manner remained casual. He asked me to call him that. It wasn't my idea. Felix, mused Bloomquist. And what did he call you, Ulf? He laughed at the sheer unlikelihood. Yes, said Ulf. He called me Ulf. Humpus looked up sharply. Is that your name, Ulf? Yes, I'm Ulf. And then with a smile, I don't mind if you call me that, if you like. So both your names mean Wolf, said Humpus. You're Wolf, Wolf. It's a common enough name, said Ulf. There are other names that refer to animals. Bloomquist frowned. Not many. You don't come across many people called dog or horse, do you? Ulf felt himself becoming irritated. Both Ulf and Varya were perfectly good names, and somebody called Hampus was hardly in a position to question the names of others. Hampus, what a ridiculous name that was. 
not that he would ever dream of drawing attention to it. Bloomquist ploughed on. Remember the story of the boy who cried wolf? Remember that one? Wolf did not reply. He turned to Bloomquist. What about you, Bloomquist? Doesn't Bloomquist mean flower branch? He did not wait for an answer, continuing. Anyway, we don't need to discuss names. When are you next due at the base? Tomorrow, said Humpus. Unless they call me in before then. They said I might have to come in at short notice if there's an emergency. But they didn't tell me what sort of emergency it could be. An invasion, maybe. Ulf looked at his watch. I could try to get over there later this afternoon. Otherwise, I'll go first thing tomorrow. Hampus gave him a look of gratitude. You've been very kind to me, Mr. Varia, he said, and then to Bloomquist. And you too, Mr. Bloomquist. In the Saab, on the way back to the office, Ulf made known his views on the army. They think they're above the law, he said. That sort of conduct, exposing a civilian to risk, is downright criminal. I couldn't agree more, said Bloomquist. I won't take no from that colonel, Ulf continued. They turned a corner, and Bloomquist indicated where he would like to be dropped off. Before he alighted, though, he turned to Ulf and said, That missing girl, the one they sent a notification out on. Singing a Magnuson, yes. Bloomquist looked at his fingernails. I could have some information about her. Ulf frowned. Well, have you seen her? No, not seen her. But it so happens that I go to a coffee bar not far from my place. Not too often, but now and then. They serve really good coffee, you see, Central American stuff. You know, it's amazing the difference the origin makes. Yes, it's important, said Ulf. But what about this place? What's it got to do with the girl? Did she go there? Bloomquist said that she did not. One of the baristas is a young guy called Lorca. He's from Gothenburg. He used to play semi-professional football, but he hurt his knee and had to give it up. That's hard luck, you know. You get a knee injury, and that's your career finished. Over. Pretty hard luck. Yes, said Ulf. It must be tough. But what about this Lorca? He was her boyfriend, said Bloomquist. Ah. Yes, or should I say one of her boyfriends? Ulf waited for Bloomquist to continue. It was difficult to hurry him on, he felt, and it was best just to let the natural stream of consciousness play itself out. There were people like that, Mrs. Hergforsch, Bloomquist, one or two others. You see, Bloomquist went on, apparently Singin Amangnuson had two boyfriends. She had the barista, this Lorca, and then she had some guy who worked in a tax office somewhere, both at the same time. Two timing, muttered Ulf. Bloomquist looked disapproving. It's unusual to find a woman doing that, you know. Men, yes, but women. The problem is, I suppose, that women are becoming more like men, and two timing goes with the territory. Do you think society's becoming more androgynous, Mr. Varia? I think so, Bloomquist. But tell me, did the young men know about the situation? Bloomquist looked amused. They didn't. Lorca said he had no idea at all until a girlfriend of Singiner's told him. She came specially to see him and gave him the news. He paused. And she told the other boy, too. Ulf asked who the informant was. It was the girl in the photograph with the guy who didn't exist, said Bloomquist. Quite a coincidence, wouldn't you agree? But that's who it was. Chapter 13 Pericarditis 
The soldier at the barracks gate, unpersuaded by Ulf's official identity card, insisted on searching the Saab. Nice old car, he said, as he rummaged around in the glove compartment. Not the sort of car a terrorist drives. Ulf smiled good-naturedly. Well, if you aren't allowed to profile people, then how about profiling their cars? The soldier grinned. Impossible. No profiling in any circumstances. Those are the orders. Including police officers? Yes, including police officers. You see, I can tell that you're not a terrorist wanting to blow us up, but I might be wrong, mightn't I? So it's best for me not to trust my instincts. Ulf agreed that this was so, but as he got back into the Saab, now declared safe after its cursory examination by the soldier, he thought, what has happened to trust? What sort of place have we become? They were painful questions, and for that reason people avoided asking them, and he would be no exception. He had a job to do, and he would do it, correctly, and in so far as he could, with compassion. The rest would have to be left to history, whatever history was. Was it what people used to call God, or Providence, or even Fate, all of which were, by their very nature, unquestionable by mortals, and certainly by any member of the Sensitive Crimes Department of the Malmö Criminal Investigation Authority. Even Mr. Arlberger, the commissioner on his distant Parnassus, had to carry out the unfathomable will of those above him in their remote fastness in Stockholm. And they, in spite of all their power and authority, had to heed the diktats of even higher authorities in Brussels and at the European court in Luxembourg. Under such structures, immense and unchallengeable, he thought, we live our small lives, doing the routine things we are expected to do, trying to convince ourselves that we are in control of our destiny and that our views count for something. And if it was like that for him, then how much worse was it for somebody like Bloomquist, several steps below him in the hierarchy, or for Martin, even lower still in that layer of society occupied by dogs, where obedience to a human master is all, and where freedom is rationed or excluded. Martin. He was making good progress now, and Mrs. Hergfosch had reported positively on her latest walks with him. He had chased some prematurely fallen leaves with what had struck her as real interest. Prematurely, because the autumn was a long way away still. There was still light and warmth and the things that dogs appreciated. Ulf smiled as he parked the Saab. He had much to be grateful for, in spite of his limited freedom, in spite of being a small part of a great and complex machine. Not the least thing to be grateful for was the fact that he was who he was, living where he was. He was Swedish at a time in history when there were many worse things to be than to be Swedish, and even if there was a small number of people who would happily blow him up simply for being Swedish, then there were many elsewhere who lived their lives under the threat of whole armies with generals and air forces and all their costly and destructive paraphernalia directed against them. The misfortune of others, thought Ulf, is our misfortune too. Its ripples spread a long way, touch the lives of all of us. A sign at the edge of the car park said, Commandant's Office. Ulf went in the direction indicated, past an ordered flower bed, the plants laid out in neat rows by a military-minded gardener, but with weeds pressing in from the edge, Ulf noted. 
Then, beyond the flower bed, was a circle of stone, from which sprouted two flagpoles, at the top of one of which was the Swedish flag, and of the other a regimental flag of some sort, private symbols of soldierly association, a bugle, a drum, a lance. The flagpoles had been white, but were no longer. Here and there the paint had blistered, exposing the dark wood below. Then Ulf was at the office, a square, impassive building of three stories built in an indeterminate period, in front of which various official-looking cars, gleaming and beflagged, were parked. The colonel did not keep him waiting, and within a few minutes of his arrival, a smartly attired female corporal, her skirt pressed in starched lines, her two chevrons of rank, golden and gleaming, ushered him into a large office at the front of the building. This was the office of Colonel Bort Pücke Theurnflichte, commanding officer of the Karl XII Gustav Infantry and semi-mechanized base, aristocrat, bon viveur, and decorated veteran of several NATO peacekeeping ventures in the Balkans, Afghanistan, and elsewhere. The colonel, a man in his mid-fifties, was at the height of his career. He was not interested in being a general, as that would have too seriously restricted his ability to pursue his other interests, and would have resulted, too, in excessive scrutiny of how he discharged his duties. Being a colonel was just right. He could run the base as he wished, surrounded by the genial and supportive company of the officers' mess, with plenty of time for the parties and official receptions in which he took such delight. Life was quiet and comfortable, and he wanted to keep it that way. Of course, every so often one of the men went off and did something stupid, committed a crime involving a civilian or something of that sort, and would need to be dealt with outside the framework of military discipline. Those cases were distasteful, as they involved the civilian police authorities, and that, he thought, as he greeted Ulf in his office, was what this detective had come about. A murder, perhaps? Or could it be something involving those missing stores of dynamite? The colonel had been concerned right from the beginning that those could end up in the wrong hands, a safe breakers, perhaps, and that would lead to all sorts of questions about security. Perhaps that was what brought this, what was he called, Ulf Varier, unlikely name, to his office. We would see. The colonel came from behind his desk to shake Ulf's hand. He led him to the side of the room where two easy chairs had been placed on either side of a table. The table bore copies of various foreign military magazines and armament catalogues, high-tech weaponry, cheek by jowl with the modern infantryman and special forces review. He saw Ulf's eye fall on the magazines. Light reading, ha! said the colonel. Ulf pointed to high-tech weaponry. I suppose everything is pretty complicated these days. The colonel spoke in an elaborate, plummy drawl. It was not an accent one heard very often, thought Ulf. It was as if it had been dredged up from a black-and-white film of the thirties. Immensely, he said. The days of simply pulling the trigger are over. Ha! We have to read the instruction manual every time we fire a shot. I was reading that the battles of the future will be fought by electronic proxies, said Ulf. Drones and robots, that sort of thing. The colonel gave a toss of his head. I read something similar myself, somewhere or other. That won't leave much for fellows like me to do. <laughs> he looked at Ulf pointedly, as if challenging him to disagree. Ulf returned the stare, noting the colonel's very light blue eyes and his unusually pink face. Drink, he thought, food, other things. The colonel was clearly not one to beat about the bush. 
I assume, Mr. Vaya, that you were here about one of the men doing something or other. Let me apologize in advance. We try to choose our men very carefully, and by and large, we make the right choices. But these days, he shrugged, you'll know what I mean. We don't have the choice that we used to have. Young men don't fancy their military life. Of course, the reintroduction of national service will make a difference, said Ulf. The colonel made an equivocating gesture. We'll see, he said. I don't look forward to getting today's eighteen-year-olds. <sighs> look at them, Mr. Fire, just look at them. Scruffy bunch, ha! High on drugs and electronic gizmos in equal measure. I'm sure you'll be able to lick them into shape. We'll have a go. But frankly, I'm not sure if it'll be worth it. In the old days, everything worked very well, because our young men were tough, Mr. Vaya. We, that's the officers, handed them over to our senior NCOs and let them get on with it. We officers had a somewhat better life in those days, I can tell you. When I was a subaltern, I went to a party every single night, would you believe it? Marvellous parties, bags of girls, champagne flowed like water, and lots of time for watching polo or whatever. Some of us raced vintage cars. My old mess had a Bugatti that we took in turns to take to various rallies. We went down to Belgium once, Mr. Varia. Raced her there on some god-awful track. Dreadful circuit. You ever been to Belgium, Mr. Varia? Ulf nodded. Yes, but not for some time. Dreadfully dull place. Ha! But wonderful food. Lashings of it. Oysters, lobsters, hundreds of different varieties of pate. Useless forces, of course, but I gather their army catering corps is second to none. Soldiers all overweight as a result. The Belgian army can't run to save their lives, I believe. They'd resist an invasion for five minutes, and then it would be time for lunch and game over. Ha! It's not about one of your men, Ulf said, or at least... It's not about one of your men causing trouble for civilians. The colonel looked puzzled. So what is it, then? He stopped. I'm sorry, that sounded impatient. I was just wondering. Ulf took his notebook out of his pocket. There was nothing in it that was relevant to what he had to say, but it gave him a sense of psychological security to have the familiar leather cover between his fingers. I believe you have community service clients working here. The colonel stared at him. Clients? That's what the social workers call them, said Ulf. The colonel's face reddened. Clients? Ha! Criminals, you mean? Varg smiled. You could call them that. I wouldn't dissent. After all, they have done something criminal in order to get here. Exactly, said the colonel. Robbery, fraud, drunken assault, sexual hanky-panky. You won't find my men doing much of that, but these low-grade characters they send us, ha! I'll tell you something, Mr. Varia. Some of these characters are real pond life. We've got five or six at the moment, and one of them, would you believe it, actually stabbed some poor fellow in the back of the knee. The back of the knee, ha! What a cowardly thing to do. If you stab somebody, I always say, never do it in the back. Do it in the front like a man. Ulf remained silent. I've sorted that chap out, I can tell you. The colonel lowered his voice. I can trust you to be discreet, Mr. Varia, can't I? And we're on the same side, I assume. Law and order, you know what I mean? Stability. This fellow who stabbed the other fellow in the back of the knee is hardly fit for society, in my view. Wouldn't be missed, so to speak, like a lot of the riffraff we come across. The colonel grinned. So I thought up a terrific assignment for him. Just a ticket for a chap like him. Ulf spoke carefully. He tried to smile. What exactly is it, colonel? The colonel smiled. 
Can't tell you, I'm afraid. Hush, hush, stuff. Terribly sorry, but I can't tell you. You not being army, you see. Ulf did not react. He sat back in his chair and gazed at the pictures on the walls. There were photographs of the colonel against varied backdrops. He was in the desert, his head sticking up out of an armored personnel carrier. He was sitting on a tree trunk in a jungle somewhere. His shirt stuck to him with perspiration. There were several photographs of the colonel playing polo, and one in which he was even wielding a cricket bat. <laughs> you people do get about, don't you? That's one of the perks, said the colonel. We certainly see the world. There was another photograph that caught Ulf's attention. This was of the colonel in what looked like an army mess. There were cases on the wall displaying large silver trophies. There were officers standing in front of a bar, a glass in each hand. And I gather that some of your messes have very fine chefs, remarked Ulf. The colonel suddenly became animated. They certainly do. We have one of the best officers messes in the country, right here. I'm actually president of the mess committee. I rather pride myself on our standards. Ulf waited for a moment or two. Then he said, So lunch can be quite an affair, I suppose. The colonel rose to the bait. Lunch? My goodness, it can be pretty good. He paused, glancing at his watch before continuing. You wouldn't fancy a bite to eat, would you? They'll be serving lunch in a few minutes, and I'm feeling slightly peckish, truth to tell. Ulf replied immediately, That's very civil of you, Colonel. I believe that our cook has been experimenting with a rack of lamb, the Colonel said. Fancy trying that? I love lamb, said Ulf. Good! Well, let's make our way over to the mess and see what's going on. We can talk over lunch, of course. He looked inquisitively at Ulf. What did you want to discuss, by the way? Ulf shrugged. Nothing in particular, he said. Behind his back, he crossed the index finger and forefinger of his right hand. It was a childish thing to do. He had always done that as a boy when he told a lie. Some old habits die hard, some not at all. I'm just interested in seeing how your end of community service works. Good, said the colonel. I can show you some of what we do, even if I can't show you the lot. The hush-hush stuff remains under wraps, I'm afraid. Of course, said Ulf. But there are plenty of other things we can discuss. Of course there are, said the colonel. Do you play polo by any chance? Ulf crossed a finger again. No, but I'm very interested in it. Are you now? said the colonel. That's wonderful. We can talk a bit about that, too. I look forward to it, said Ulf, and crossed his fingers once more. You know something, said the colonel. Polo is beginning to catch on in Russia. He shook his head in disapproval. Mind you, they're the most dreadful cheats. They really are. No sense of fair play, none at all. They left the colonel's office and walked a short distance to a low-roofed building on the other side of the parade ground. Two miniature cannons, knee-height and made of polished brass, stood on either side of the front door. Those don't work, said the colonel, pointing to the cannons. But we love them. The regiment stole them from the Germans at the end of the war. Ha! <laughs> Inside, a uniformed attendant spirited Ulf's overcoat off to an unseen cloakroom. Then the colonel led him into a large rectangular dining room, down the middle of which a polished mahogany table ran from one end of the room to the other. This was laid with six places at the far end, gleaming silver, starched white table napkins, and glittering crystal. Once seated, the colonel showed Ulf the printed menu. Officer's Mess, it was headed. Beneath the heading, the menu read, Lunch, Wednesday, Potage d'Asperge, Rack of Lamb with Rosemary and Red Wine Sauce, Tiramisu, Coffee and Petit Four. The colonel nodded towards the menu. Yes, yeah, see, he said, 
I told you we'd get a very good lunch. He reached for a small bell in the middle of the table and rang it. This will summon the steward, he said. He will bring us a bottle of wine. Any preference? Ulf, who never drank at lunchtime, demurred. A very small glass for me, he said. Whatever you choose, but I'm driving. All the more for me, the colonel said cheerfully. I have only to get myself to the other side of the parade ground. Not difficult. Ha! The steward appeared, and the colonel ordered a bottle of Medoc. Goes well with lamb, I'd say, wouldn't you? Yes, said Ulf. You can't go wrong with Medoc. No, said the colonel. Bordeaux, toujours Bordeaux, I always say. When the steward appeared with the opened bottle of wine, the colonel gestured for Ulf to be served first, and then took the bottle from the steward and filled his own glass up to the rim. Toasts were made, and the meal began. The colonel had drained his first glass of Medoc by the end of the soup course. He replenished his glass and downed that, too, before the rack of lamb arrived. That required a third glass. But given the voluminous nature of the crystal glasses, the bottle was now virtually empty. Please don't hold back, said Ulf politely. Would you allow me to buy the next bottle? Absolutely not, said the colonel. That's against mess rules. I'll sign for everything. The steward was summoned, and another bottle of Medoc appeared. By this stage, the colonel's face had turned from pink to red. His speech was still quite clear, but seemed to have loosened up considerably. He was now talking about other NATO powers, and was giving Ulf his assessment of their capacities. The French aren't bad, he said, and some of them are pretty good, but they're difficult soldiers to command. Dreadful. Constantly complaining and making strange noises of disagreement. Boff and poof and so on, when you give them an order. They also gesture a lot. Watch them marching. They gesture a lot with their hands while they march. Very odd. Of course they have their foreign legion. I visited them down in Corsica once. Camp Raffali just outside a place called Calvi, full of bandits and desperados from all over. They give them false names when they sign up, but they're pretty effective. You put a platoon of legionnaires in somewhere and poof, trouble over. Opposition all dealt with, just like that. Pretty effective. Rather like the Gurkhas that the British use. They frightened the wits out of the other side with those kukris of theirs. The colonel took another large mouthful of wine. Now the Italians. Oh, dear. Such charming people, mostly. Apart from the 33% of the population engaged in organized crime. Lots of style and fantastic uniforms. Really very smart. Even their carabinieri are dressed every bit as smartly as our generals, if not even more so. Wonderful chaps to have on show, but a bit flaky when it comes to the business. Their heart isn't really in it, you see. The Italian army loves sitting about drinking cappuccinos. Their alpini, of course, have those wonderful hats with feathers in them. I envy them that. That must give the Russians something to think about, I'd say. And so it continued. After they had eaten their rack of lamb and were waiting for the tiramisu, Ulf decided the moment was ripe to continue his inquiry. These people you get for community service, he said. These riffraff, said the colonel, now beginning to slur his words. Yes, what about them? You mentioned somebody who had been convicted of stabbing someone in the back of the knee. Yes! said the colonel. Very short fellow. You could trip over him if you weren't watching your step. Ridiculous. He paused. I wish I could tell you what I have planned for him. You could, you know, said Ulf. 
The colonel shook his head and then tapped the side of his nose in a gesture of confidentiality. Sorry, no can do. But I'm a serving officer of the Department of Sensitive Crimes, said Ulf quietly. We're very careful about confidentiality, you know. The colonel looked thoughtful. I suppose you're a sympathizer, he said. Naturally, said Ulf, wondering what it was he was expected to sympathize with. You see, we should stop handling these people with kid gloves, said the colonel. Absolutely, said Ulf. The colonel leaned towards him. Ulf noticed that his nose was now almost glowing, small red blood vessels being visible on the sides of the nostrils. Yet he still seemed hesitant, and Ulf decided to pour him another glass of wine. Very fine, Medoc, this, said the colonel appreciatively. This community service man, Ulf prompted, Oh, him? Yes, well, I've got a little surprise for him, said the colonel. He laughed. His community service should go with a bang, I'd say. Ha! Ulf waited. The colonel took another sip of his wine. Bomb disposal, he whispered. I've put him on bomb disposal duty. How's that? That'll teach him to stab people in the ankle. Knee, said Ulf. Yes, knee, wherever. The point is that a few days in bomb disposal will sort him out. The colonel reached for his glass. I had a very good man in bomb disposal, but he lost his nerve and asked for a transfer. I gave it to him because I thought he deserved a change. But when I looked around for volunteers, nobody else stepped forward, not a soul, which shows what the country has become, I'm afraid. Then I thought, this nasty piece of work, this knee-stabber, would be ideal. So that's where he's going, ha! But he's had no training, Ulf pointed out. Bomb disposal is a very skilled business, isn't it? A bit, said the colonel. But we have pretty good manuals, you know. He can read up before he tries his luck. Wolf sat back in his chair. I don't think you should do it, he said. You can't put innocent civilians into bomb disposal units. Innocent, the colonel retorted. Or guilty, said Ulf evenly. They're still civilians. Nonsense, said the colonel. It'll do him good. And frankly, who cares if he blows himself up? Serve him right. Ulf persisted. No, Colonel, you shall not do it. The Colonel stared at Ulf. The earlier bonhomie of the lunch seemed to evaporate. Excuse me, Mr. Varrier. You are not in command here. I am. Now, how about some tiramisu? No, thank you, said Ulf. But in respect of this man, you are not to expose him to any danger. Give him a job peeling potatoes or painting things, and if you don't, I shall report you. I shall report you for recklessly endangering life. You said it yourself, your own words. You said you were happy for him to blow himself up. Report me? said the colonel, his voice rising unsteadily. I am a serving officer of His Majesty's forces. Who will believe your word rather than mine? Ulf smiled. A tape recording might help, he said, and with that he withdrew the small recording pen device tucked into his top pocket. It makes very good recordings, he said, and it was very silly of me to leave it on. I must remind myself to turn it off. I really must. The colonel stared at him for a moment, and then broke into a grin. Fair enough, he said. I'll put him in the kitchens. Thank you, said Ulf. Not at all, said the colonel. Now, did I ever tell you about a month I spent on secondment in northern India? 
Those Indian army messes are superb, just superb. Tiger heads on the wall, fantastic curries, kedgeri for breakfast and so on. Most agreeable company and remarkable horsemen. They have some camel-mounted units too, you know. They look marvellous with their long lances decorated with flags. Wonderful, quite wonderful. When he left the base, Ulf telephoned ahead to suggest to Anna that as his return to the office would more or less coincide with the morning coffee break, they should meet in the cafe before he came up to the office. She agreed. He had left her a message about Bloomquist's revelations, and she was keen to discuss this with him. This case is getting no simpler, she said over the phone. I'd like your input. Sometimes the most complicated cases are in reality the simplest, said Ulf. There was a brief silence. The most complicated, she began, and then, Ulf, what exactly does that mean? Ulf was not sure. That's the point, he said. Meaning is not always apparent. He drove back, parked the Saab, and made his way to the café. It was not busy, and he was able to get his preferred table at the window. He felt proprietorial about that table, resenting those who were sitting at it when he came in, as if they had no right to be there. That feeling, though, amused him, as might any unjustified conviction or sense of entitlement. Tables in cafes were common property, and nobody had a greater right than anyone else to occupy them. And yet, and yet, there were subtleties in the claiming of space. We staked out our territory on beaches, small squares of sand to which we felt entitled to return after our swim. We created all sorts of unseen boundaries, temporary and informal, by leaving our possessions on seats and benches. A jacket left on a chair made a claim every bit as specific and discouraging as a notice of legal title. This is mine. I'm coming back. Don't think of sitting here. Anna arrived five minutes later. Good, she said. You've got our table. Ulf told her he had just been thinking of that. It's not really ours, he said. It should be, said Anna. We've been coming here for years. Ulf looked out of the window. Possession, he mused. Don't they say that possession is what counts? He transferred his gaze to Anna. So, who owns Sweden? I don't know what you mean. The people who owned it in the past, or the people who are here right now? She looked at him cautiously. Nobody likes to talk about that, do they? He agreed. They did not. I think it's a mixture, he said. The past has its claims, but it has to recognize that there's a different present. And behave in a civilized manner? Ulf nodded. Precisely. Behave Swedishly? Ulf laughed. Exactly. Behave Swedishly. Which involves? That was difficult, thought Ulf. And yet he knew what Swedish behavior was, and could recognize it when he saw it. Being civil to other people, I suppose. Anna became businesslike. Social philosophy was all very well, but there was a job to be done. And that leads me to the matter in hand, said Anna. Bloomquist's information. Ulf asked her what she felt. Did the fact that Beam had betrayed Singiner to her two boyfriends make a difference to her view of the case? Anna frowned. Two boyfriends? What's she thinking of? Ulf shrugged. I've never understood how people can do that, or why they should want to. Variety, said Anna. You get fed up with somebody, but you don't want to end things with him. Somebody else comes along who makes you feel good. It's understandable, I think. But would you do that yourself? asked Ulf. 
The question came out spontaneously, and he immediately regretted it. She could always take his question the wrong way, as an invitation or suggestion, in spite of their conversation of a few days ago. She did not, and Ulf felt relieved. I wouldn't, she said, but then most people say they won't do things until they do them. She looked at him, and for a few moments they held each other's gaze. Ulf felt he had to bring the moment to an end. He was about to say what he thought he would not say, and so he had to stop. Give me your thoughts, he said, about what's been going on. If Bim has, she held up a hand, hold on, let's look at it in terms of who wants what, or rather what we think people want. Then reverse it, suggested Ulf, because often what we think people want turns out to be the opposite of what they actually want, or indeed who they are in the first place, just in case we are looking in the wrong place. Ulf reflected on this. Anna was right. When Bloomquist had first mentioned Beam's role, he had immediately thought that this provided a clue to Singina's disappearance. They knew nothing about these boyfriends, but if a young woman disappeared, the first person whom one might wish to interview was usually the boyfriend, especially if, as in this case, the couple had become estranged. Here, of course, there were two young men who might feel strong resentment against Singina, and in Ulf's view, if anything had happened to her, then they would be prime suspects. He suggested this to Anna. The two boyfriends, what do you think? Possible, she said. Remember that case we had three years ago, when that makeup artist went missing and was eventually found up north, under the permafrost? Yes, under the permafrost, said Anna. That was the boyfriend's doing, wasn't it? He worked up at the research station. He discovered she was having an affair with that television producer, the wildlife man, the one who made that film about the reindeer. Ulf remembered the case well. He had spent two weeks up north, accompanied by Carl on that occasion, as Anna could not leave the children back in Malmö. He remembered the digging, the sound of pneumatic drills hammering away against the silence of the tundra, and then the discovery, and the thought that always occurred to him in such circumstances, that this was the moment when the end of somebody's world was confirmed, not the world of the victim so much as the world of those left behind, the relatives. It defeated him that anybody could ever bring such a result about if they knew or could imagine the heartbreak of the victim's family. Of course, the people who did these things were usually deficient in moral imagination. They could not see what it would be like because they simply lacked the capacity to do so. Expecting them to understand and to empathize was like expecting a blind person to see a rainbow. Ulf signaled to the waitress to take their order. So you think we should bring those young men in? Yes, said Anna. We'll need to get Bloomfist to give us the details. Did he tell you which coffee bar one of them works in? Ulf said that he had not. Bloomfist likes to keep things to himself. I think he resents being excluded from the investigation. But it's none of his business, Anna pointed out. Ulf said that Bloomquist did not see it that way. I think he feels frustrated. He's tried twice to get into the Criminal Investigation Authority, but was refused on both occasions. Somebody said they thought he was dyslexic. That shouldn't be a bar these days. No, said Ulf. You'd think not. But I was told that on his application, he wrote that he wanted to get into the AIC rather than the CIA. I suspect that didn't help. Anna smiled. Poor Bloomquist. She looked at her watch. Could we get him to come in here, if he's free? Can't do any harm, said Ulf. 
taking his phone out of his pocket. As he dialed the number, he told Anna about the results of his visit to the colonel. Hampus is off bomb disposal duty, he said, and I don't think the colonel will try that one again in a hurry, thanks to my recording pen. Anna was surprised. You have a recording pen? Bloomquist's phone was ringing. Ulf took his pen out of his breast pocket and showed it to her. Where are the controls? she asked. How do you play something back? Ulf smiled as he took the pen back from her. You don't, he said. It can't record at all. He paused, slipping the pen back into his pocket. Not that the colonel was to know that. Ha! said Anna. That's what the colonel kept saying. It was a pronounced mannerism he had. I hope I don't say ha too much, said Anna. You'd tell me if I did, wouldn't you? Ulf reassured her that he would notify her of any irritating mannerism, but that he felt she very rarely said ha. Anna thanked him. It's good that we can talk so freely, she said. Yes, it is. But he thought, I can speak freely to you about everything except the one thing that is really important. I can't speak to you about that. I can't tell you how I feel about you, because I cannot allow myself to feel that way. That is forever closed to me. Forever. Bloomquist blew over his coffee. Too hot, he said. These people always serve their coffee far too hot. It's bad for the lining of the stomach. You're right, Bloomquist, said Ulf. I find I get heartburn if I drink things too hot. Heartburn is very unpleasant, said Bloomquist. Mind you, did I tell you what happened to me four or five months ago? Ulf began to say that perhaps some other time, but Bloomquist had already started. I woke up, he began. It was about midnight, I think. No, hold on. It was more like one in the morning. Maybe even a bit later. My wife is a very sound sleeper. She'll sleep through a thunderstorm right overhead, and I didn't wake her up. But what a pain I had in my chest, somewhere there over the sternum. I had some of those antacid tablets, and I took one. Maybe even two, I forget. But it made no difference. It was worse when I lay down, so I spent the rest of the night, morning, actually, sitting in a chair in the living room. Eventually, at six or so, I realized that this wasn't going away, that this wasn't heartburn. So I woke up my wife, and she drove me to the emergency department up at the hospital. They took one look at me, and I could see they thought, heart attack. So they hooked me up to an ECG machine, and you know the result? They said the pattern was typical of classic pericarditis. You know what that is? Pericarditis? Anna said that Yo had explained it once, but she had forgotten what he'd said. One of his colleagues had it, he said. Well, it's inflammation of the pericardium, said Bloomquist. It's caused by a virus in most cases. You breathe it in, or it's on food or whatever, and... It goes to the pericardium. An anti-inflammatory relieves it. They gave me that, and I was fine. But I was told not to exert myself for six weeks. He paused. That's pericarditis for you. Ulf and Anna stared at Bloomquist, who stared back at them. Eventually, Ulf said, Most unpleasant. Yes, said Anna. I'm glad you recovered, Bloomquist. That young barista you spoke to, Ulf said, I think we should have a word with him. Bloomquist took a tentative sip of his still steaming coffee. Why? Ulf resisted the temptation to tell the policeman that it was not for him to question the direction of an investigation being carried out by the sensitive crimes department. Because we think he, or the other boyfriend, could have a motive for harming Signe. One of them may have something to do with her disappearance. Bloomquist considered this for a few moments, and then shook his head. No, 
he said. It won't be one of them, or oh, certainly not the barista. How can you be so sure? asked Anna. Because of the way he told me, answered Bloomfist. If he had done something to her, he wouldn't have volunteered the information. He knows I'm in the force. I often go there in my uniform. Bloomquist waited for them to absorb this before he continued. If you would like my opinion, that young woman has disappeared of her own free will. In order to put heat on Beam? prompted Ulf. Beam told her boyfriends of her two-timing. She had a score to settle with her. But Beam had a score to settle with her, too, Anna interjected. Yes, said Bloomquist. Both of them would love to do something to get the other into trouble. So which one did it? asked Ulf. Beam or Singine? Bloomquist shook his head. That's too binary. There's another factor in the equation. Anna looked unconvinced. What? Linnea, the girl who reported it. Ulf had not anticipated this. Why did she get involved? Because of something the barista told me. Ulf and Anna were silent as they waited for Bloomquist to explain. He said to me that he used to go out with Linnea before he became a member of Singiner's stable. I had the impression that Singiner had prized him away from Linnea. Ulf was listening intently, and she, Linnea, didn't like that. Presumably, said Bloomquist. Who would? So Linnea had a grudge against Singiner and Beam and Singiner had a grudge against each other. Bloomquist took another sip of his coffee. That's a bit cooler now. You know, one of these days somebody's going to scald their tongue and make a big song and dance about it. He took another sip. Grudges? Yes, definitely. It took a bit of effort on Ulf's part, but he felt they needed to know what Bloomquist would do. So who should we speak to, Bloomquist? Linnea, said Bloomquist, without hesitation, because she's the one who's been hoping that we would take action against Singina when she turns up. She's hoping, I imagine, that Singina will be punished for wasting police time with her non-disappearance. Ulf and Anna spoke in perfect unison. Non-disappearance? That girl's around, said Bloomquist. She's just pretending to disappear. She'll be staying with Linnea, I imagine, because she, Singin, may have no idea that Linnea has a grudge against her. Of course, they may both be enjoying the spectacle of Beam being investigated by us. Schadenfreude, as the Germans call it. You really think Singina will be with Linnea? asked Anna. Isn't that just a bit too predictable? Bloomquist shrugged. When you do what I do, he said, you get used to the predictable. Everything I see, more or less, is predictable. You might not see that in your position. He looked at them challengingly. But it's often clear to me, often... They stood outside the door of Linnea's apartment, one of a number in a block of student dwellings. Eck proclaimed a piece of cardboard in the name slot outside. Ulf rang the bell, glancing at Anna and Bloomfist as he did so. He was eager to locate Singine, but he did not want to find her as a direct result of information from Bloomfist. I suspect we are wasting our time, he said. Even if the bird was here, she'll have flown the nest. Bloomquist seemed confident. I doubt it, he said. There came the sound of a bolt being drawn inside, and the door was opened. Linnea stood before them, dressed in a kimono and wearing large sheepskin slippers. Her face fell when she saw who was standing on her doorstep. Miss Bank's daughter, and... and... We're colleagues of Ms. Bank's daughter, said Ulf, Malmö Criminal Investigation Authority. And police, Bloomquist added. 
Linnea had regained her composure. I'm sorry, she said. This isn't convenient. Please come some other time. Ulf shook his head. That won't be convenient for us. Sorry. Linnea glared at him. This is definitely the wrong time for me, she said. It's just the wrong time. Believe me. Studying? asked Anna. Surely that can wait. We won't need much of your time. Linnea turned to her. No, not studying. I've told you this is not a good time. You're going to have to explain, Bloomquist said. Tell us why we can't come in. Linnea drew in her breath. All right, she hissed. Since you ask, I'll spell it out for you. I'm having sex, that's why. All three were taken aback, but it was Bloomquist who recovered first. Oh, yes, he said. In your slippers? She narrowed her eyes. What's wrong with that? Just because you people are so, so conventional? Ulf had to laugh. Your generation thinks you invented sex, he said. And then Bloomquist, without any warning, pushed roughly past Linnea. Taking advantage of her surprise, he walked quickly down the short corridor into the apartment's living room. Ulf called out after him, Bloomquist, we don't have a warrant. But it was too late. Linnea turned to rush after him, and Anna and Ulf followed. Once in the living room, they saw that there was another person there, sitting in an easy chair, fully clothed and looking embarrassed. Well, well said Ulf. Here you are, Singine. Bloomquist turned to Linnea. Your partner, I take it? Linnea was crimson with embarrassment. I was only joking, she said. I'm not a lesbian. Who said you're a lesbian? asked Singine. What do these people want? We want to talk to you, said Ulf. Singine's surprise seemed unforced. Why? I've done nothing wrong. Where have you been? said Ulf. Here. All the time? Singina shrugged. The last few days. A week, probably. She looked at Linnea. It's been about a week, hasn't it, Linnea? Linnea did not answer. Since you broke up with your boyfriend, boyfriends? asked Anna. Singina looked down at the floor. Yes, she mumbled. I felt I should get out of the way. Because they were angry? Anna pressed. Singina took a few moments to answer. Yes, you could say that. But maybe also because I just couldn't face them. I felt so bad about everything. Ulf turned to Linnea. Did you talk to Singina about reporting this? Before Linnea could answer, Singina blurted out, Reporting what? That you were missing, said Ulf. This brought an immediate reaction from Singina. Me? Me? Missing? she exclaimed. I've been here all the time. I haven't been missing. Now they all turned to face Linnea, who had sat down heavily on a sofa, her head sunk in her hands. I feel very ashamed of myself, she said. I didn't see it turning out like this. Anna exchanged glances with Ulf. Tell me, Ulf said to Singina, has your phone been switched off all this time? Singina said it had. I didn't want the boys to get in touch, she said. I just couldn't face it. And what about your parents? Singina made a dismissive gesture. They're away. They're in Japan. Oh, you stupid, stupid young woman, muttered Ulf. What was that? What did you call her? said Linnea. Stupid, said Bloomquist, stepping up to stand within a few inches of her. And that's what I call you, too. Stupid. Anna felt that there had been sufficient calling of names, cathartic though it had undoubtedly been. You're going to have to come with us, Linnea, she said. And me? asked Singina. Ulf shook his head. I don't think you've done anything wrong. But if I were you, I'd phone your parents immediately. 
Don't worry about time zones. Just call them straight away and tell them you're fine. Explain to them why you haven't been in touch. What now? Right now, said Ulf firmly. This instant. Bloomquist was staring at Linnea. You're a very stupid young woman, he muttered again. You'll be lucky to get community service. Anna said, let's not anticipate too much. I'm just informing her. There'll be a vacancy in bomb disposal, I think. Ulf tried to keep a straight face. Possibly deserved in this case, he said under his breath. Bomb disposal? asked Linnea. Bloomquist nodded. You'll soon find out, he said. Peeling potatoes, probably, said Ulf. Bloomquist looked disappointed. You'd think the army would be more enlightened about food values. Linnea looked confused and miserable. I'm really sorry, she said. I only did it because Beam asked me to. Ulf frowned. Hold on, he said. Beam asked you to? Beam? Yes. She wanted you to think that Singina had staged her disappearance to spite her. Then she would be arrested. She didn't think you would arrest me. But you were the one who made the false report, Bloomquist pointed out. Linnea looked away. Maybe, she said. But Beam was the one who thought it all up. This is ridiculous, said Ulf. Anna drew Ulf aside. Do we really need to take this any further? She whispered. Ulf hesitated. He glanced at the two young women, looking at one another in confused misery. He made up his mind. There was mercy for the guilty, at times, and mercy, too, for the plain silly. Listen, he said. All three of you have been very foolish, to put it mildly. I'd say stupid, suggested Bloomquist. That too, agreed Ulf. But we shall draw a veil over the whole affair if we receive undertakings from all of you that this nonsense stops right here. No more going to the police with any ridiculous stories. No more squabbling over anything, and I mean anything. Understand? They stared at him in an incomprehension that turned fairly quickly into delight. The officers did not stay, but made their way back to the Saab. Bloomquist was smiling. Well, he said, solve that one. Ulf said nothing. He was not sure that they had solved anything. In fact, he was not sure about whether they had really got to the bottom of whatever it was that they had been investigating. Do you feel confused? He intended the question for Anna, but from the back seat, Bloomquist answered as well. Anna said, yes, completely. And Bloomquist replied, no, nope, not at all. Ulf did not take the matter further. They dropped Bloomquist off at his police station, and then, at Anna's request, Ulf drove her to pick up her two daughters from their swimming club, since her own car was being used by her husband. Ulf had met the girls before, and they were not inhibited in their breathless account of the afternoon's practice races. Ulf listened with only half an ear. He was thinking about the visit to Linnea's flat. There was something he had spotted, but of which he had not really taken much notice. Now it came back to him. A pair of men's shoes beside a chair. They had not really registered, but now they did. What were they doing there? In a break in the girl's narrative, he said to Anna, That flat, yes, what about it? There was a pair of shoes next to a chair. Yes, she said. I was going to talk to you about that. I noticed them. I wondered whether you'd seen them too. Ulf looked in the driving mirror. The two girls in the back seemed absorbed in a magazine. What do you think? he asked. There were men in there. He gave her an inquiring look. Men? 
They were two left shoes, said Anna. I noticed that. I thought it a bit odd. If there were two left shoes, then there must have been two right shoes somewhere. Two pairs of shoes, four legs, two men. So what were two males doing in that flat? And why were they hiding them from us? Anna thought the answer obvious. Because there was something going on, she said, and they didn't want us to find out what it was. Ulf sighed. I knew it, he said. I knew there was more to this case than meets the eye. You're right, said Anna, but I don't think there's much we can do about it, mainly because we don't know what it is. Of course, it may be none of our business, Ulf pointed out. After all, we can't sort out all of the world's problems. True, said Anna. Our role as detectives is strictly circumscribed. We are not miracle workers, Ulf said, nor avenging angels. They drove on. Ulf looked up at the sky. He felt a curious, indescribable happiness and was not sure why he should feel this. Was it because he was in Anna's company, or was it because of something quite different? He could not tell. But he remembered learning years ago that the important thing with happiness was simply that you should feel happy. It did not matter, the philosopher said, if you did not understand the reason why you felt happy, as long as the happiness itself was there. That was all that counted. And then he thought, what if the shoes belonged to Singina's two boyfriends? What if they'd been there in the house when they called round? Bloomquist said he had spoken to one of them, but that was a few days ago. What role did they have in all this? I'm thinking of remote possibilities, he said to Anna. Don't, she said. Just don't. Then she added, because the remote often becomes less remote, if you think about it. And that just complicates life. He would need to think about that, he told himself. Later, not now. Chapter 14 Lycanthropy The following morning, Ulf prepared to leave for the small country town in which he was due to begin his investigation into the matter with which Commissioner Arlberger had entrusted him. He had arrived in the office early in order to be able to leave before ten. Karl was already there and had been at his desk for a good hour when Ulf came in. Anna would arrive a bit later, as would Eric, who was usually last in and first to leave. Message for you, said Carl. A motorcycle courier brought it. It must be important. He handed Ulf the brown envelope and watched as he opened it. Commissioner Arlberger? Ulf nodded. He read the handwritten letter with growing dismay. I know that we want to limit the number of people who know about this, wrote the commissioner, but I've been feeling a bit concerned about your undertaking this without backup. Perhaps I'm being a bit too careful, but I feel that you should have somebody from the uniformed branch with you, just in case. Better safe than sorry is my policy, as you may already know. So I have asked somebody to be allocated to you, and I understand there's an officer by the name of Bloomquist who will be coming with you. Please impress on him the need for the utmost discretion. Warmest wishes, Felix Albury. Ulf became aware that Karl was watching him, and now his colleague's curiosity got the better of him. Bad news? he asked. Ulf crumpled the letter into a ball and tossed it into a waste paper basket. Then, thinking better of it, he retrieved it, folded it, and tucked it into his pocket. No, he replied to Carl. Neither here nor there. That was not true. 
The attachment of Bloomquist to this otherwise intriguing and sensitive mission was not good news at all, as far as Ulf was concerned. He would now have a drive of almost an hour, with Bloomquist going on about steroids and potato skins and all the other things he liked to talk about. And at the other end, he imagined that the policeman would want to tag along with him, offering his insights at every turn, and generally making what would otherwise have been a pleasant and interesting day in the country into an irritating chore. Karl had guessed that the letter concerned the private task that Ulf had spoken about a few days earlier, and about which they had managed to extract no information at all. You're going off somewhere today? he asked. Ulf nodded. Yes. Karl waited a few moments before posing his question. Where? The country, said Ulf tersely, and I'm to take Bloomquist. That's what that letter was about. That's all. Karl raised an eyebrow. Bloomquist? The traffic was light and the Saab, to which Ulf occasionally extended the compliment of having an inner life, seemed pleased to be on the road. The last time Ulf had driven the car any distance, it had developed a mysterious rattle somewhere in the engine compartment, but this seemed now to have disappeared. The part in question, he told himself, had either settled down or fallen off altogether. An old car was like an old body. Various provinces of the central system revolted, but could be pacified by nothing more than sympathy and a spot of oil. Many parts were superfluous to the main purpose, which was to get the chassis from one point to another. If that had to be done without operating windows or heating systems or any of the other optional extras, then so be it and tomorrow there would be something fresh to worry about. Bloomquist was in a cheerful mood. They had been authorized to spend up to three days on the inquiry, staying at the commissioner's cousin's spa. This was an unusual arrangement, as the acceptance of free hospitality was against departmental rules, but it had been specifically approved of by the commissioner himself. "'given the special circumstances of this sensitive case. "'I've never stayed at a spa before,' said Bloomquist, "'as Ulf drove through the last vestiges of the Malmö traffic. "'I take it there'll be a gym.' "'Bound to be,' said Ulf. "'People go to these places for the sake of their health. "'Exercise is all part of that.' "'He got no further. "'Oh, you don't have to tell me that,' Bloomquist interrupted. I follow the high-intensity exercise program. Have you heard of that? Ulf wished that he had not referred to health, but it was too late now. Sighing inwardly, he said, No, tell me about it, Bloomquist. Well, said Bloomquist, there have been a lot of studies that... Ulf allowed his mind to wander, as Bloomquist explained about high-intensity exercise. Like Bloomquist, he was pleased to get out into the country, and Abikos, their destination, seemed like a pleasant coastal town, just short of the better-known and more popular beaches of Skåne. He knew that he would have to work and that this was not a holiday, but the weather report was encouraging and there would be plenty of fresh air and sun. He had contemplated bringing Martin, and had established that the spa was happy to accommodate dogs, but he decided that it would be better for him to be in the familiar surroundings of Mrs. Herkforsch's apartment while he was having his treatment. Progress had been made, and he would not want to jeopardize that with a sudden change of surroundings. Ulf was not at all sure how he would proceed with this case. All that he knew so far was that there had been what the commissioner called unfortunate incidents at the spa, and that these had been picked up by online reviewers. It was very easy to frighten people, and apparently this had been happening. 
Since the incidents had started, the spa's room occupancy had tumbled, and two of the staff had been laid off. He was curious about the incidents. He wondered whether these were acts of vandalism. There were so many ways one could interrupt the smooth running of a hotel and the peace of mind of the guests. Interference with the hot water system, noise in the middle of the night, fights in the bar, the adulteration of food, a piece of rotten fish or meat tossed into the soup could easily have the desired effect. The problem with sunblock, Bloomquist was saying, is that if you apply too much of it and too often, you won't absorb the necessary vitamin D. But then if you use too little, there's the prospect of sun damage. Apparently in Australia, where there's a hole in the ozone layer, you have to be really careful. They take sun hats very seriously in schools out there. If a child doesn't take a sun hat to school, then no time in the playground. It's the only way. A friend's aunt, you know, got badly burned when she was in South America. She's normally very careful, but she forgot to put sunblock on one day, and they were pretty high up where they were staying, 6,000 feet, I think, and so the sun's rays at that level are particularly dangerous. South America, thought Ulf. He liked the idea of travel and had done a certain amount himself, but for some reason he had never been very far south. In fact, when he thought of where he had been, without exception, his journeys were northern ones. He had, of course, been to Finland and Norway. Denmark, being just over the water, did not really count as travel, in Ulf's view. And the same applied to the Baltic countries, to the countries known as the Ias, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Ulf liked Tallinn, which he viewed as a sort of eastern Sweden, and he felt that there was an unspoken bond of sympathy between those who lived in the shadow of Russia. He had been to Scotland, too, and Iceland, and for three glorious weeks in the second year of their marriage, he and Letta had hiked in Nepal. He remembered the thinness of the air and the cold at night, and the sky that seemed to him to sing. It was so vast and light, and at that altitude so close to the touch. You see, said Bloomfist, what you have to watch are those areas that seem to attract the sun. Your nose, for instance. You have to watch your nose. Then there are the ears. If you go to a dermatologist, and he or she, I have a lady dermatologist, you know, if he or she carries out a general inspection, then it will include the tops of the ears. Have you seen sailors? Yachtsmen, I mean, because professional sailors, merchant seamen, I mean, usually keep out of the sun, but yachtsmen take a look at their ears. No, I'm not joking. Just look at the tips of their ears, and you'll often see sun damage. All north, thought Ulf. All north. And then there was North America. He had been there first when he was a student at Lund, and he had bought a cheap ticket. But that had been to Canada, and when he got there, he seemed to go north, as if drawn by instinct. He had been up to Yellowknife, where he had worked for a month as a barman, and then, with the proceeds, had gone off on a month of travels. He had been determined to see the United States, but he ended up only seeing the northern tip of it, Minnesota and Wisconsin. He had been given a good welcome there because of the Scandinavian population of those northern states, but before he knew it, he had been obliged to return home. So he never got to New Orleans, as he had hoped to do, because North had claimed him once again. One day he would go. South America perhaps India, or even Australia, where he had a distant female cousin who lived in Darwin and who had once turned up in Malmö and invited him to visit her in the friendly way of Australians. Stay as long as you like, the cousin had said. In fact, stay for the rest of your life. Lots of people do. They never go home. What would that be like, he wondered? Warmth? Sun? 
He would have to be careful about sun exposure, of course, as Bloomquist had said, and other things, too. He had asked the cousin about crocodiles, and she had replied that they did have them around Darwin, but that she had very rarely seen one in the wild, although they had once been on a picnic, and there had been one in the river, and they had all moved well away from the bank, just to be safe. She had a friend, she said, who knew somebody who had almost been eaten by a saltwater crocodile, but he had been drunk at the time, and it was often the case that people who fell foul of crocodiles had drunk too much at the time of the incident. Crocodiles, he suddenly said. Bloomquist, who had been talking about the danger of tanning salons, was arrested mid-sentence. Crocodiles? Yes, said Ulf. I was just thinking, you were talking about sun, weren't you? or at least you were a few minutes ago, and I thought about crocodiles. Have you ever seen a crocodile, Bloomquist? In a zoo, Bloomquist replied, just lying there. He was doing nothing particular. You know, they're cold-blooded, I think, and they need sun to get them going. Apparently, if they're cold, they can't harm you very much, although, frankly, I wouldn't care to test that, would you? What about a wolf? Have you seen a wolf, Mr. Varrier? No, not really. Well, we don't get them down where we are, said Bloomfist. They're up near that place, what's it called, Shins Barrier. Apparently there are about three hundred wolves in Sweden, which isn't bad, bearing in mind there were none about fifty years ago. People are odd about wolves, aren't they? Do you know that dogs are descendants of wolves? All dogs, even those ridiculous little dogs you see in the parks. Wolves. Imagine how embarrassed a real wolf would be if he knew that he was cousin to a Shih Tzu. Of course, we shouldn't think animals have feelings like us. I don't think they can be embarrassed, do you? My daughter's cat is incapable of feeling anything very much, I can tell you. And certainly not embarrassment. Ulf looked at his watch. The miles were passing, but in a strange cloud of facts and warnings and unilateral, unanswered observations. What would it be like, he wondered, to do a long train journey with Bloomquist, say on the Trans-Siberian Express or one of those trains that cross Canada, day after day of Bloomquist on every conceivable subject? He thought of Bloomquist's wife. How would she have greeted the news that he was to be away for up to three days? With relief, he imagined. He smiled privately. But then he reminded himself that Bloomquist had somebody who loved him, and who presumably appreciated him for what he was, a loyal, good husband who provided for his family without complaint. Mrs. Bloomquist would be proud of him, he thought, and she would attribute his lack of promotion so far to the fact that his superiors did not understand him, or to jealousies within the force, or something of that nature. Our shining heroes are never held back by their own limitations. It is usually the work of others. The spa sat in its own large grounds off the main road into Abacos. The town was only a short walk away, but a feeling of rural tranquility had been encouraged by stands of birch trees planted by a previous owner. These trees not only masked the buildings from the road and from neighbors, but also provided a haven for colonies of small birds. As Ulf parked the Saab, the sound of birdsong could be heard coming from the birch trees, while from somewhere inside, music, Mozart, he thought, drifted across a wide, carefully trimmed lawn. There was a cluster of deck chairs in the center of this lawn, draped with towels, but unoccupied, it seemed, by any of the spa's guests. Their arrival had been observed from the main building, 
a sprawling red-roofed construction with the air of a domestic house that had been extended in a haphazard way by a series of owners. A door opened, and a man in white trousers and a green open-neck shirt strode out to greet them. This was Balza Birkmann, proprietor of the spa and husband of Angel. Balza was a man in his early fifties, fourteen years the senior of Angel, who now followed him out onto the lawn to greet the visitors. Felix told me you were coming, Mr. Varia, said Balza, after he had shaken hands with Ulf. And your colleague, of course, Mr. Blomqvist, said Blomqvist. Balza smiled. Of course, of course. Angel joined them. As introductions were made, Ulf glanced appraisingly at her, wondering how it was that these two had ended up together. It was a line of thought that often occurred to him when he met couples. Sometimes it was obvious enough why one person married another. Identity of interest, similarity of background— Factors of that sort explained a great deal of mutual human attraction. Ulf had also observed that people often went for somebody who looked like them. This conclusion would surprise many, he believed, but every time he put it to the test, it seemed to be confirmed. And then Dr. Svensson himself had supported the theory with chapter and verse from one of his professional journals, in which an article on the subject had appeared. Finnish researchers, Dr. Svensson revealed, had examined extensive collections of wedding photographs going back decades and had concluded that the parties often looked remarkably similar. Tall, dark-haired men married tall, dark-haired women. People with prominent cheekbones chose those with a similar feature. Noses were attracted by noses of a similar shape, and so on. Ulf had been interested to discover that his own observations appeared to be borne out by empirical research, although when he mentioned this conversation to Karl and Anna, they had been unimpressed. I don't look at all like my wife, said Karl. She looks very different. That's because she's a woman, remarked Anna dryly. By and large, though not always, men tend to marry people who look like women. You know what I mean, said Karl. People can look the same, but different. Features are nothing to do with gender. I don't look at all like you, said Anna, adding hurriedly, not that I wouldn't like to. Yo's a good-looking man. I don't think he is, said Eric, who had been following this conversation from the other side of the room. No offense, of course, but I don't think he is. And anyway, these people who did that research, didn't it occur to them that all Finns look the same? Carl shook his head. Look the same? The Finns? Yes, said Eric. It's well known. Look at a bunch of Finns, and I challenge you to tell the difference. They're a good-looking people, for the most part, but nobody can ever tell one from the other. They're all just Finnish, really. He paused. And so it's not surprising that they found people married people who looked like them. They didn't have much choice. But now, glancing at Angel, and then again at Balsa, Ulf felt that any theory of similar types would, in this case, be challenged. And that led him to another conclusion, not one based on any information, he had only met them a few minutes ago, but one that had come to him on the basis of immediate intuition. Angel did not like her husband. It was an extraordinary thought to have so soon after meeting somebody— and yet it had come to him quite forcefully. He had no idea why he should think this. On the face of it, it was absurd to jump to such a conclusion on the basis of no evidence at all. But there was a current of animosity between these two, and it emanated from her. There was no doubt about it. As they walked into the spa to collect their keys— Ulf reflected on his rushed and surely unreliable assumption. 
It had to be unreliable, he told himself, because any belief based on nothing, as this one was, was open to that fundamental objection. But why should he think it? That puzzled him. Carnality, he thought. Some people ooze carnality. They seem to be made for it. They are intensely sexual beings. That is what they think about. That is what they do. He glanced again at Angel, walking beside him. She was strikingly attractive, even if in a slightly blousy way. She was what Ulf's mother would have called the barmaid type. Bless you, Ma, he thought. Bless you for all your strong opinions and colorful categorizations. Bless you for all the respects in which you were misguided or just plain wrong. And for all you wanted in this life and never got. He looked again at Angel. Her blonde hair, shoulder length, had been tied back with a red ribbon. A red ribbon stood for carnality. Of course it did. And her blouse was tight, deliberately so. You don't wear clothes that are tight unless you want to get out of them at the first opportunity. Everybody knew that. And her jeans were close-fitting, and even her shoes looked several sizes too small for the feet that were within. And then he glanced at Balzer. He was a tall, well-built man with a pleasant enough smile, but... Ulf looked again. He was hairy. Not only were his wrists and the tops of his hands covered in fine black hair, but his cheeks were also her suit. And his mouth, when he opened his mouth, the teeth were very prominent. He was not buck-toothed in any way, but the teeth were definitely larger than normal. Ulf suppressed a shudder. There was something about Balzer that was physically repulsive, at least to him. And that, he decided, was a view shared by Angel. She was also repulsed by her husband's physical appearance, and Ulf could see the reason why. These two were physical opposites, walking exceptions to the rule of spousal physical similarity. Ulf did not invite Bloomfist to take part in his first meeting with Balzer and Angel. This was not because he wanted to exclude him from the investigation. No, it was, he had to admit to himself. Of course it was. But he felt justified in not having Bloomfist there because the other man's presence could distract him from what he had to do, which was to allow his own sense of what was happening to develop. He did not want Bloomquist waffling away, as he undoubtedly would do, preventing him from picking up the nuances. And there would be nuances, Ulf decided. They would be there, under the surface, and they would affect his assessment of what was happening. Initially, he spoke to Angel, whom he found behind the reception desk in the foyer. She suggested that they move to the office, where she invited him to sit down while she leaned against a desk at the side of the room. Balze will be along in a few minutes, she said. He's just checking the plunge pool. But in the meantime... She left the sentence hanging. We could talk, supplied Ulf. Yes, we could talk. He, I mean, Felix, said you might help us work out what's happening. Ulf nodded. Yes, if you could fill me in on the details. Angel was sizing him up, Ulf noted. Her glance, superficially casual, was penetrating. We've had a series of negative reviews, she said. Guests have complained of noises at night. One or two claimed to have seen things. Noises, thought Ulf. Things. Noise in general, he asked. Bad sound insulation? That could be a problem in hotels, he knew. What happened in the next door room was not always what one wanted to hear. No, 
said Angel. Strange noises outside, or so they said. Howling, according to some of them. Shouting? Angel smiled. No, they said howling. She paused to let this sink in. Odd, isn't it? And you have no idea what this was, or rather, who was howling? Angel shrugged. I'm a very sound sleeper, she said. I go out like a light and re-emerge the next morning. It would take a thunderbolt to wake me. And what about the things that people saw, or claimed they saw? Again, Angel shrugged. They weren't very specific. One said that they saw a movement in the bushes beside the lawn. Another said there was a face at the window. It was all very general. Some creature, apparently. A dog? asked Ulf. Perhaps a stray? Angel said that she thought this was unlikely. There are no big dogs around here, she said. The farmer over that way, she pointed out of the window, keeps a couple of largish dogs, but they're very well controlled. He always shuts them up at night, he says, and they don't wander anyway. It was at this point that Balsa entered the room. He nodded politely to Ulf before sitting down behind the desk. Ulf noticed that Angel seemed to ignore his arrival, avoiding eye contact with her husband. Your wife was telling me about the guests hearing things, said Ulf. Balsa sighed. People complain, but now all we get is complaints. Bookings are right down. What do you think is happening? Ulf asked. The question was addressed to the room in general, but it was Angel who answered. I think the place might be haunted, she said. There might be one of those, what do you call those things, polter... Poltergeists, said Ulf. Yes, one of those. Balzer shook his head. Nonsense, he said. Ghosts don't exist. Angel gave him a sharp look. How do you know? she asked. If you've never seen one, how do you know they don't exist? Balzer frowned. I can't see how to answer that question, he said. Angel clearly felt that her point had been made. Oh, there you are. Ulf asked whether they felt there was anybody who might be pursuing a vendetta against them. No, there was not. Or what about a competitor who might want to put them out of business? No, the other hotels in the area were all doing perfectly well and would have no interest in damaging them. It's all very odd said Angel. If you can find anything out, I'll be very pleased. Ulf thought that she spoke without much conviction. She was indifferent to the problem, he decided. She did not care. Yes, agreed Balsa. It would be very helpful. He looked down at his hands. I don't think we can carry on much longer, losing money. No, said Ulf. Nobody can, I suppose. Unless you're the government, said Angel. You can just borrow indefinitely if you're the government. Ulf thought this was probably true. Governments seemed to operate in a world where the plain facts of economics did not apply. And yet surely profligacy caught up with everybody sooner or later, even if you were a government. And where did all that money come from? Who were the people who lent it to governments? After this exchange, nobody spoke for a while. Then Ulf broke the silence. I suppose I should just look around, he said, and then perhaps I'll hear or even see something tonight. That's possible, said Angel. It seems to be happening most nights. She left the desk against which she had been leaning and made for the door. Ulf noticed that she paid no attention to Balsa, whose eyes followed her as she crossed the floor. He hates her, he thought.
When Ulf returned to his room, he found Blomqvist waiting outside the door, now wearing his uniform. I thought I might make some inquiries in the town, the policeman said. Ulf smiled. I'd better fill you in, he said, so that you know what to inquire about. Ulf told him what he had heard from Angel and Balzer. I suspect that this is all about some unbalanced local having a bit of fun, he said. Or it might be a previous employee, somebody with a grudge. He paused. He did not imagine there was much point in Bloomquist wandering about asking questions. It would keep him busy, he supposed, and that was a worthwhile goal. What exactly did you propose to do in the village? What can you ask about? Build up a picture, Bloomquist replied. Get the feel of the place. Put my ear to the ground. That sort of thing. No harm in that, said Ulf. But for now, I propose to sit in the sauna for a while. Then take a dip in the plunge pool, I think. Bloomquist looked concerned. Be careful of the plunge pool, he said. Infection. Those things harbor all sorts of germs. I'll be careful, Ulf reassured him. And the water can get too hot, Bloomquist continued. People scald themselves. I'll watch the temperature, said Ulf. Shall we meet for dinner, then? He felt that he had to say that. He knew that dinner with Bloomquist would involve his sitting there, listening to the other man going on about something or other, but he had to be friendly. And for all his irritation with his colleague, Ulf's fundamental kindness won out, as it invariably did, and he would not want Bloomquist to pick up on his irritation. Ulf was relaxed when he went into the spa dining room that night. There were a few other guests, although most of the tables were unoccupied. Bloomquist was already seated, and he waved across the room to Ulf as he came in. The curious thing about these places, said Ulf as he sat down, is that they make you feel better almost immediately. Psychological, said Bloomquist. I suppose so. Mind you, a sauna always lifts the spirits. He glanced at the menu. What about you, Bloomquist? A successful nose about the town? It was as if this was the question for which Bloomquist had been waiting. Very, he said, beaming. I made good progress. In fact, he hesitated. In fact, I think I've found out what's going on. Ulf was not prepared for this. But we've just arrived. Bloomquist leaned forward. I found a very useful source, he said. They're always helpful, those people. Which people? asked Ulf. Librarians. They know everything. Ulf said nothing. A very charming woman, Bloomquist continued. I found myself outside the library, and so I went in and introduced myself. She was impressed with the uniform, you could see that, and she told me all I needed to know. Ulf waited. I said that we were staying at the spa. She told me that she knew the owners, Balzer and his wife. Ulf was not sure where this was going, but Bloomquist explained. You can find out a lot about people from the books they read, you know. Oh, uh, yes? Take Eric, for example, that man who works in your office. He reads books about fish. That tells you he's interested in fish. Ulf smiled. He tells you that himself, quite often, in fact. Bloomquist persisted. I said I imagine they're keen readers— but she'd asked for some special titles recently that the library had been obliged to borrow on the interlibrary loan system. Ulf was on the point of saying that this was irrelevant detail, but something prevented him from dismissing Bloomquist's long-winded account. She's been reading books on lycanthropy, said Bloomquist. That's what the librarian told me, anyway. For a few moments, Ulf said nothing. Man into wolf. 
It was a strange obsession, one of those myths that for some reason seemed to engage people's imaginations, even if it was an altogether fanciful notion. At length, Ulf said, Are we to take it that her husband is a werewolf? Bloomquist was silent. Well, Bloomquist, is that what you are seriously suggesting? Bloomquist looked away. I'm not accusing anybody of anything, he said. I'm just reporting to you what I was told. Ulf made light of the information. Frankly, I think all one can conclude from that is that Angel is interested in paranormal nonsense. Plenty of people are. Aliens and ESP and all that stuff. People lap it up. Perhaps, said Bloomquist. But what if Balzer is a werewolf? There's no such thing, said Ulf. Bloomquist shrugged. I've just reported what I heard, he said. I'm not saying that I believe in werewolves. Just as well, said Ulf. I'd hate to have you committed. I assume that the psychiatric wards are full of people who believe in werewolves and the like. Don't go down that path, Bloomquist. Let's just see, said Bloomquist. Let's just see what happens tonight. Nonsense, Bloomquist. It's just nonsense. Some may not think it nonsense, said Bloomquist. He nodded in the direction of the office once more. Did you see his wrists? Did you see how hairy they were? I did, Ulf answered. But look, Bloomquist, there's no such thing as a werewolf. And what has this got to do with anything? The howling, Bloomquist said. The movements in the bushes? But that's ridiculous. Even if it is Balzer, which is highly unlikely, why would he scare his own guests? Because he can't help it, said Bloomquist. If you start turning into a wolf, you can't stop yourself. This was too much for Ulf. Oh, really, Bloomquist? This is all utterly fanciful. You haven't been drinking, have you? Bloomquist looked affronted. Certainly not. There was reproach in his voice, and Ulf immediately apologized. I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. It's just that, well, werewolves don't exist. They just don't. They exist, Mr. Varia. You may think you know better, but go and speak to people in the country. Find out what they think. I don't care what people believe, said Ulf. They swallow all sorts of things. I wouldn't base my own views on the curious views of others. Well, said Bloomquist, that's as may be. But I think I'm right about this, you know. There was now a note of resentment in his voice. You did ask me to tell you what I found out, Mr. Barrier. That's what I've done. Ulf felt guilty. I know, Bloomquist, I know. And... I'm sorry, I didn't mean to sound dismissive. Bloomquist was pacified. Well, we can see what happens tonight, he said. I'll be next door. I'll wake you up if I hear anything. And I shall do the same for you, said Ulf. Ulf dreamed of Letta. For some time after her departure, he had dreamed of her regularly, Almost nightly, he thought. The dreams were confusing, as are the dreams we have of those who have died. They are with us, they are still there, but also they are not, because they have died. So it was with Letta. She was still living with him in his dreams, but she had also left him. All he had to do was to tell her that she had made a mistake, and she would realize that and come back to him. But he was mute in the dream, unable to find the words that would effect her return. And then he would wake up to feelings of regret and loss and sadness. In this dream, he was engaged in a conversation with her in a place he did not recognize. She was sitting in a car, and he was speaking to her through the wound-down window. 
There was another man at the wheel, but he could not make out who it was. It must be her new man, he thought, although he was hardly new, as Letta had been gone for four years now. She had left him for a stage hypnotist, a Dane who had lived in Sweden for fifteen years, and who earned his living through a combination of stage shows and work as a hypnotherapist, helping smokers who were desperate to give up their habit, or those whose social confidence needed boosting. Ulf had met him on only one occasion, after Letta had gone. He had done his best to make the occasion a civil one. He saw no point in being at daggers drawn with Letta. And he still loved her, of course. He had steeled himself for small talk and the scrupulous courtesies of a dreaded meeting. And, by and large, the encounter had not strayed beyond those. But then the other man had said, We are all unhappy, you know. Everybody. Everybody. Ulf had waited for him to say more, but he had not. And Ulf had resisted the temptation to say that destroying the marriages of others hardly added to the sum total of human happiness. Ulf awoke suddenly, and for a few moments he had difficulty in remembering where he was. But when he remembered, he quickly shrugged off the vestiges of sleep. Something must have woken him, some sound, presumably, but now there was nothing. Then he heard it. It was faint, as if coming from some distance away, but it was quite identifiable. Something, some person or animal, was howling. Ulf slipped out of bed. He had left his shirt and trousers ready on a chair, and now he put these on in the darkness. He did not want to switch on a light, as that might warn the creature, if that was what it was, that somebody was up and about. So he fumbled with his belt and his shoes before quietly opening the door onto the corridor outside. He gave a start. Bloomquist had obviously been woken by the same sound and was waiting for him, in uniform. Did you sleep in that? Ulf whispered, gesturing to the police top with its badges and buttons. Bloomquist did not answer, but pointed down the corridor. It's coming from somewhere over that way, he said, his lowered voice barely audible. They made their way down the corridor in the darkness and then out onto the lawn. The chairs in the middle of the grass were black shapes in the night, like grazing sheep. Above them, a cloudless sky had traces of light, as they were on the cusp of full summer and its white nights. They heard the howling again. This time it was louder, and it was easier to tell the direction from which it came. Over there whispered Ulf, pointing to a cluster of bushes on the far side of the lawn. They both began to run, and as they did so, Bloomquist began to blow loudly on a whistle. Ulf stopped in his tracks, taken by surprise by the whistle. Whatever it was that was howling must presumably have been surprised as well, as there was a commotion in the bushes, a movement of branches and leafage, and a harsh, truncated yelping sound. Then silence. Bloomquist now produced a flashlight and played the beam over the dense undergrowth. You are under arrest, he shouted. Nothing happened. Ulf sighed. Red Ridiculous Bloomquist. Whom are you arresting? he asked. The bushes? Bloomquist pointed with the flashlight beam. Whoever's in there? Then let's take a look, said Ulf. Ulf parted the branches while Bloomquist moved the flashlight beam around the ground before them. There was nothing to be seen, just branches and twigs and leaves. Ulf began to walk back towards the building. He got away, said Bloomquist. So it would seem, said Ulf. And I assume you believe it was him, Balzer. Of course it was, said Bloomquist. 
Unless there's another werewolf in the vicinity. Oh, really? Ulf exploded. Get a grip on yourself, Bloomquist. Those things don't exist. Bloomquist fought his corner. Well, why don't we go and knock on their door and wake him up, if he's in? He won't be, I suspect, because he will have been out being a werewolf. Ulf agreed, if only to exclude what he thought of as Bloomquist's quite unreasonable supposition. It won't tell us anything, he said, but if it'll keep you happy, we might as well. It will, said Bloomquist. Angel had pointed out their flat earlier on. This was tacked onto the edge of the main building like an architectural afterthought. It was in darkness now, although a small external light glowed dimly near the front door. Ulf rang the bell. Somewhere inside he heard a chime, and then silence. He pressed the button again. A light was switched on, and the door opened. It was Balzer. He was fully dressed. Ulf stared at him. Balzer's eyes appeared unfocused, as if he were looking over their shoulder into the darkness beyond. He seemed confused. I just wanted to check that all was well, said Ulf. Balzer said nothing, but stood in the doorway, swaying slightly. Are you all right? asked Ulf. Again, Balzer did not respond, but suddenly put his hand up to his face, as if to feel his features. Should we get a doctor? muttered Blomqvist. A light was switched on behind Balzer, and Angel appeared. She was wearing a dressing gown and had something in her hand that Ulf could not quite make out. Everything's fine, she said, taking Balzer by the elbow and pushing him gently back into the room. Was there a noise? Yes, said Ulf. We heard howling. This did not seem to interest her very much. Well, I think we should all get back to bed, she said. We can talk in the morning. With that, she closed the door. Bloomquist turned to Ulf. See, he said. See, it's him, and she must know it. Ulf was unsure what to say. Unlike Bloomquist, he did not believe that there was anything paranormal happening here, and yet the expression on Balzer's face had been quite chilling. It had been one of anguish, he thought. The next morning, Ulf was out of bed a good hour before breakfast was due to be served. He found Angel already at her desk at reception, examining the booking register. We need to talk, Ulf said. Angel looked up. Her gaze, Ulf felt, was flirtatious. Any time, she said. There was nobody about. Ulf drew in his breath. I've reached the conclusion that your husband is the person causing the disturbances, he said. She showed no reaction. Really? she said. And then, in the same flat tone, she added, That's not true. Why was he fully dressed when we rang your bell last night? Angel took the question calmly. He hadn't gone to bed yet. It was one thirty. Angel shrugged. Some people don't go to bed until three. He's a night owl. Or a night wolf. What? Ulf looked away. Nothing. And then he continued. He seemed confused. He had dropped off in his armchair, said Angel. Sometimes he does that. He drops off to sleep for a while before he finally goes to bed. If you wake him up, then he's a bit fuzzy. Who wouldn't be? So he was with you all the time? asked Ulf. Yes, I told you. We were both in our flat. She paused. You're barking up the wrong tree, Mr. Varier. If there was somebody in the garden last night, it wasn't my husband. Ulf tried another tack. 
Are you interested in lycanthropy? He watched her. She did not reply immediately, but then when she did, her reply was disarming. Funny you should ask. Yes, I'm doing a course in folklore, one of these correspondence courses. I have an essay to write on popular myth. Wolves play quite a big part in those, you know. Ulf met her gaze. She was telling the truth, he thought. What she said was perfectly feasible, and his instinct, cautious though he was about trusting his intuition, was to believe her. Balzer was not a werewolf. How could anybody be anything that simply did not exist? And whoever it was who was creating these disturbances was still there. He and Blomqvist would have to be quicker next time if they were to catch him in the act. But they still had two nights before they were due to return to Malmö, and it was, he remembered, a full moon that night. A full moon was a real temptation to a werewolf, not that they existed, of course. Ulf decided to explore the area that morning. There was nothing for him to do at the spa, and rather than spend the day waiting for the evening, he thought he would take the Saab for a brief drive along the coast. He had initially contemplated doing this by himself, but on reflection he decided to invite Blomqvist to accompany him. Blomqvist showed an almost pathetic need for approval. That could be irritating, as such needs often are, but it was easy enough for Ulf to be kind to him, and after all, it would cost him nothing. No doubt, on this drive, he would be regaled with lengthy Blomqvist stories, full of odd diversions and non-sequiturs, but it would be unfriendly, he felt, to leave Blomqvist to entertain himself. We can get a bit of lunch somewhere along the coast, he said, and then be back by mid-afternoon. A very good idea, said Blomqvist. I don't know this part of the country at all. They set off, following the coastal road through a series of small resorts. It was a fine day, with broad sunshine and only the hint of a breeze. Who needs to go off to Italy for a holiday, said Ulf. We have all this right here in Sweden. True, said Blomqvist. Mind you, there's a lot to be said for going to Italy. I went, you know, a few years ago. My wife and I flew to Milan, and then we went by train down to Rome. You know what we saw there? Ulf shook his head. Let me guess, though. The Pope? Blomqvist burst out laughing. Right, first time, or almost. We didn't quite see him, but had we been in St. Peter's Square a few minutes earlier, we might have... There was a big crowd, you see, and when I asked somebody what was going on, they said that the Pope had just gone past on a bicycle. A bicycle? exclaimed Ulf. No, surely not. That's what I thought, said Blomqvist, but that's what he said. He was a Dutchman, I think, this fellow I asked. I think he might have been pulling your leg, said Ulf. I don't think so, said Blomqvist. And... I suppose it's possible, isn't it? Didn't one of them play tennis? John Paul II, I think. He played tennis, I think. Yes, but that's rather different, isn't it? Somehow that seems the sort of thing a Pope might do, but ride a bicycle through St. Peter's Square? It's hardly in keeping with the dignity of the office. I don't think any Pope would do that, Blomqvist. I really don't. After they had been driving for about half an hour, they came to a sign beside the road that announced Sunshine Beach, 400 meters. Ulf slowed down. Should we take a look? he asked. These dunes seem rather attractive. Blomqvist nodded his assent. Perhaps we might have a stroll along the sand, he said. We could get a bit of fresh air into our lungs. They followed a rough track that led off into the dunes. It was bumpy, and at one or two points the underside of the Saab scraped along the sand. 
Ulf slowed down to walking pace. There, said Bloomquist, pointing to a parking area beside the track. There were several cars already parked in the small, tree-lined enclosure, but there was room for the Saab. Ulf nosed it into a parking place, and he and Bloomquist got out. Between them and the sea, which they could hear nearby, was a ridge of dunes, largely covered with wispy reed grass. Let's take a look, said Ulf. A narrow path wound its way through the dunes in the direction of the sea. A short distance along this, a small sign, standing at something of an angle, gave information about the beach. Ulf pointed to this, and he and Bloomquist made their way over towards it. Nudist Beach, the sign said. Members of the public are asked to respect the privacy of users of this beach. No radios, no dogs, no consumption of alcohol. Bloomquist chuckled. Look where we've ended up, Mr. Faria. A nudist beach. Ulf smiled. Well, it's the weather for it. And then he added, Not for you and me, of course. I wasn't suggesting that we should... No, of course not, said Bloomquist. But what does this sign mean? Respect their privacy. Does that mean we can't go any further? Ulf said that he did not think that. I suspect it probably means no photography and no, well, looking. Or not too much looking suggested Bloomquist. No, staring. That's different from just looking. Staring is... Looking intently, offered Ulf, or looking in the wrong places. They fell silent. Then Bloomquist ventured, I still want to take a look at the sea. Not stare at it, asked Ulf. No, just look. After all, they don't own the beach. Beaches belong to everybody, don't they? Ulf said that he thought that was the case. I think we can go and take a quick look at the sea, and then come back. We don't need to hang around. No, said Bloomfist. You first, Mr. Varia. They continued to walk along the path. After a short distance, it climbed over the ridge of a dune, the wind-swept sand crumbling away under their feet. Coastal erosion, said Bloomfist. They need to plant more of this grass. It binds the sand. Yes, said Ulf. There are some countries that are being blown away, you know, said Bloomquist. Many people don't know that, but wind erosion is really serious. Yes, said Ulf. They were almost at the top of the dune, and his attention was drawn by an umbrella top he could see in a hollow ahead. He pointed to this, and he and Bloomquist stopped. Nudists, whispered Bloomquist. Look! A man and a woman were lying half in, half out of the shade provided by the umbrella. Being in the hollow, they could not see Ulf and Bloomquist, even though they themselves were afforded little privacy from anybody approaching on that path. Then the man moved, rolling out from the shade and into the sun. The woman followed, and it was at this moment that Ulf gave an involuntary gasp. The woman was Angel. Bloomquist saw her, too, and pointed mutely. That's Angel, whispered Ulf, from the spa. Yes, Bloomquist whispered back. And who's he? Ulf shrugged. Heaven knows. What are they doing? asked Bloomquist. The man was applying sunscreen to the woman's back, rubbing it in with wide, sweeping movements. Sun protection, said Ulf. Very important, whispered Bloomquist. You know, if you don't use that stuff, you can get serious skin damage. But there's something else to bear in mind. Vitamin D. Sunblock can prevent you getting the necessary... Ulf interrupted him. You've told me this already, Bloomquist in the car. Bloomquist looked puzzled. Did I? Yes, you did. You told me about how sunblock can prevent the body making vitamin D. Well, it can, said Bloomquist firmly, and that couple down there should be careful. Mind you, 
I suppose nudists have better vitamin D levels than most of us, wouldn't you say? Ulf tapped Blumquist on the shoulder. Look, he said, they're getting up. The man, having suddenly looked at his watch, had said something to the woman. She answered him, and then, reaching for a towel, stood up. They're leaving, whispered Ulf. We'd better turn back. But we were going to take a look at the sea, Blumquist protested. Ulf pushed him gently. Come on, Blumquist, we don't want her to see us. I don't see why, Ulf cut him short. There's a reason, Blumquist. That's her lover, pretty obviously. So? So that may throw some light on what's going on at the spa. It's relevant information. They made their way down the track and were back in the car by the time Angel and her companion appeared. Their car was parked some distance away from the Saab, and so they did not see the detective and his colleague watching them, nor did they notice when the old Saab slipped out of the parking place and followed them discreetly down the track and onto the main road. Angel was at the wheel, the man in the passenger seat beside her. Making sure that he did not lose sight of the couple, but careful not to get too close, Ulf followed Angel's car into the traffic. I want to see where she goes, he said to Blumquist. I think that could not only be relevant, but very relevant. Blumquist looked thoughtful. You don't necessarily know that he's her lover, he mused. Oh, come on, Blumquist. A man and a woman lying naked on a sand dune? Let's not be too naive. But nudists are odd, Bloomquist persisted. They could just be friends. Presumably nudists have ordinary friendships, unclothed friendships, so to speak. He paused. When I was a boy, there was another boy who brought a nudist magazine to school to show it around. It had photographs of nudists playing ping-pong. I've never forgotten that. Ulf smiled. Bloomquist was almost quaint in a slightly irritating way. Ping pong, nudists, vitamin D. As well you might not, he said. But usually nudists do these things in big groups rather than a deux. He might just be a relative, said Bloomquist. You can't exclude that, can you? Ulf sighed. Would he have to spell it out? I don't think so, Bloomquist. There was an aspect of the situation that indicated otherwise. Perhaps you didn't notice. Notice what? asked Bloomquist. That particular aspect. What aspect? Suffice it to say, Ulf replied, suffice it to say that there was an indication of well, really, Bloomquist, I don't think we need to go there. Where? asked Bloomquist. Ulf said nothing. So much communication between people, he thought, depends on what is not said rather than what is said. Yet there were people, and Bloomquist was clearly one of them, who seemed unable to pick up the unarticulated clues that conveyed our meaning— they needed things to be spelled out, not just alluded to, but made brutally clear. And yet poor Bloomquist, for all his failings, only wanted to be helpful, only wanted to be appreciated as a colleague, only wanted his efforts to be recognized. But he would never make a proper detective if he failed to observe the glaringly obvious. Where? repeated Bloomquist. We don't need to go where? Ulf sighed. There was not a place, it was a metaphor. Or was it, more correctly, a metonym? Without thinking, he muttered, It's a metonym. Bloomquist looked puzzled. He hesitated for a few moments, as one might do when anxious about displaying ignorance. Then he said, you may think I'm ignorant, but I don't know what a metonym is. I don't think you're ignorant, Ulf reassured him. I don't have as much formal education as you do. 
Bloomquist went on. I know you went to university. I didn't have that opportunity. Ulf swallowed. He felt acutely embarrassed. He had not intended to make Bloomquist feel inadequate, but that was exactly what he had done. He should not have said anything about metonyms. It was grossly insensitive on his part. What could one expect if one were a senior detective in the Department of Sensitive Crimes and one went on about metonyms to members of the uniformed branch? It was a form of flaunting of superior knowledge that Ulf, by deepest instinct, would never consciously engage in. I didn't know about metonyms myself, Ulf said quickly. Not until recently, that is. Then I read about them. Bloomquist looked out of the window. I thought you might have learned about them at university. No, we didn't. I studied criminology, you know, and a bit of philosophy. Bloomquist continued to gaze out of the window. I never had the chance to study philosophy. Ulf kept his eyes fixed on the road ahead and the car they were following. It seemed to him that Bloomquist was verging on self-pity now, and there was no reason why he should pander to that. Self-pity was almost always unattractive, and it did Bloomquist no favors to indulge him. You can't really say that, Bloomquist he said briskly. Anybody can study philosophy at any time. There are plenty of courses you can take. You can even study philosophy online, you know. My English isn't good enough, said Blomqvist. There are courses in Swedish, countered Ulf. Plenty of them. You don't need English to study philosophy. He paused. How about enrolling on one of those courses? You could become quite knowledgeable, don't you think? You could be quoting Aristotle to me next, eh, Bloomquist? I'm not sure who he is, said Bloomquist. He was a Greek philosopher, Ulf explained. He lived, he hesitated. When had Aristotle lived? Bloomquist turned to face him. So, he said, when did Aristotle live? I'm afraid I don't know, said Ulf. A long time ago, though. Anyway said Bloomquist. What's a metonym? It's a word you use to refer to something else. So if you say the White House is under pressure, you don't mean that the actual building is under pressure. You mean the administration that works in the building is under pressure. That's a metonym. So why don't we go there? asked Bloomquist. Where? This place you said we shouldn't go to. The metonym. Ulf's grip on the steering wheel tightened. I suggest we move on, he said, metaphorically. Bloomquist pursed his lips. I've been thinking of those nudists back there, he said. What do you think drives people to take their clothes off, Mr. Varia? I suppose they want to get back to a more natural state of being, said Ulf. Clothes are an encumbrance, after all. Bloomquist smiled. I've just remembered something, he said. When I was a boy, we used to play a game of thinking of people without their clothes. We did this with teachers, mostly. We'd whisper, in the bathroom, and that would be a signal for all of us to imagine the teacher with no clothes on. Then we'd start to laugh, of course, and the teacher would say, What are you people laughing about? And of course we couldn't reply. It was very funny. Ulf raised an eyebrow. Children, he said, we were all childish once. Mind you, Bloomquist continued, I still do it from time to time. I find it helps. You think of people with no clothes on? Bloomquist was taken aback by Ulf's surprise. Why, don't you? Not these days, said Ulf. Maybe when I was much younger. A boy, perhaps. I don't see what's wrong with it, said Bloomquist, somewhat peevishly. It's not harming anybody. No, said Ulf. I'm not being judgmental. I'm just a bit, well, surprised, that's all. He made a mental note to tell Anna. 
He would have to warn her, he thought, that if she saw Bloomquist looking at her in a peculiar way, she should be aware. The car in front slowed down. They were now not far from their hotel, and Ulf wondered whether Angel was driving directly back there without dropping off her lover first. Would she do that? Was Bolzer aware of this man's existence? Was this an open marriage of the sort one read about occasionally, prevalent, it would seem, among a certain set of advanced thinkers and artists, people for whom conceptions of marriage and fidelity were risibly bourgeois and conformist? The car now indicated it was about to turn off the road. Ulf slowed down further, keeping well back from their quarry. And then, as the car made the turn, Bloomquist read the sign at the turning. Hotel Lillebeck. Sea views. All facilities. Home cooking. The side road onto which Angel and her companion had turned was no more than a brief track ending in front of the hotel. From where they had pulled in on the main road, Ulf and Blomqvist were able to watch unobserved as the man alighted from the car, waved to Angel, and then disappeared through the hotel's main door. As he did so, Angel started her car again and began to make her way back to the main road. This was the signal for Ulf to pull away quickly and head back to the spa. Neither he nor Blomqvist said anything for a short while, but as they neared their hotel, Ulf revealed to his colleague what he thought was happening. That's her lover, he said. We know that. We can also conclude that he runs the Hotel Lillebeck. That we know. Yes, agreed Blomqvist. We know that, but what does it tell us? It means said Ulf, that Angel might have split loyalties, in hotel terms, that is. So imagine that you're close to the owner of the Hotel Lillebeck, close enough to go to a nudist beach with him. Ulf grinned. Yes, that close. And further imagine that you don't like your husband. Are you sure of that? asked Blomqvist. Ulf assured him that his assessment of relations between Balsa and Angel was correct. Unexpressed feelings, he said. Unexpressed feelings will out. I saw them. Those two are not friends. Bloomquist shook his head. I've never been able to understand how people can stay together when relations become that sour. How do you feel when you wake up and see a head you don't like on the pillow next to you? Regretful, suggested Ulf. Trapped? Resigned? He thought of all the ways that so many people felt about life. Life was a matter of regret. How could it be anything else? We knew that we would lose the things we loved. We knew that sooner or later we would lose everything— and beyond that was a darkness, a state of non-being that we found hard to imagine, let alone accept. Blomqvist sighed. I knew a boy at school who was always unhappy. Nothing was right for him, and when I saw him later in adult life, he was still miserable. He had done none of the things he'd wanted to do, he was in the wrong job, he was living in the wrong place, and he had married the wrong girl. Everything was wrong. That's very sad, said Ulf. Yes, said Blomqvist. I remember his father's car very vividly. He used to come to collect his son, this boy was called Lush, from the school gate. The car was an old Saab, much older than yours, much older. A Saab 92. It had that lovely sweeping back that those cars had. It was rounded, too. People called it a feminine car because of its curves. It was very beautiful. Ah, uh, said Ulf, Saabs were beautiful, or had been. Blomqvist looked wistful. It was one of the originals, you know. 
It was made back in 1950. They started production in 1949. 1949? Yes, said Bloomquist. The engine was two-stroke, and it was mounted transversely. It used the thermosiphon method. Ah, said Ulf. He wondered what a thermosiphon looked like, or had. A thermosiphon? Yes. A thermosiphon works by letting cold liquid sink and hot liquid rise. That's how it circulates fluids. Ulf tapped the steering wheel with his fingers. They were now almost back at the spa. Blumquist, he said, how do you know all this? He wanted to say, why do you know all this? But he did not. Bloomquist shrugged. I just do. And then he added, I thought everybody knew about the Saab 92. Didn't you? No, said Ulf. I did not. But I do now, obviously. For a few moments, Bloomquist was silent. Then he said, Of course, knowing a lot of stuff might make me suitable for detective work, rather than staying in the uniformed branch. I would have thought that might be taken into consideration, wouldn't you? Ulf decided that he should give no encouragement. There was no point in raising hopes that would only be dashed later on. No, he answered. The force doesn't work like that, Bloomquist. There are lots of other factors involved. Such as? challenged Bloomquist. Experience? Manpower needs at the time? A hundred things, actually. He paused. But look, we were talking about what somebody in Angel's position might do. Let's accept that she doesn't like Balsa. Let's accept that she's having an affair with the Lilibeck man. Let's imagine that our Lilibeck friend would like to buy a better hotel because his own hotel is having a rough time of it. In such circumstances, he might look around for a hotel that's going on the market cheaply because... Because bookings have been slow, interjected Bloomquist. Because there have been strange goings on and people are put off. My thoughts exactly, said Ulf. So she, Angel that is, knows her husband is a werewolf, Ulf corrected him. Alleged werewolf, please. Werewolves don't exist, you see, but I believe there are people who behave like werewolves for some reason or other. All right, said Bloomquist, alleged werewolf. So she does nothing and lets him go out and howl and so on, knowing, of course, that this will hasten the sale of the spa. To her lover, yes. Ulf nodded silently. He was parking the car now, and their conversation would soon come to an end. So, what do we do? asked Bloomquist. We report back to the commissioner. We tell him. Can we have a sauna before we go? asked Bloomquist. We've come all this way to a spa, and I haven't had a sauna yet. You may, said Ulf. I won't. You should protested Bloomquist. It opens the pores. It gets impurities out. Ulf shook his head. No, thank you, Bloomquist. Bloomquist persisted. Impurities are bad for you, you know. I know, said Ulf. I'll try to avoid them. You should consider colonic irrigation, said Bloomquist. Ulf switched off the engine. He wanted to get back to Malmö. Ulf invited Bloomquist to accompany him to see the commissioner the next morning. It was the least he could do, he felt. For all his faults, Bloomquist deserved his share of whatever credit there might be for solving an otherwise obscure and difficult case. And if the commissioner should choose to express satisfaction at the result, then it was only right that Bloomquist should be there to receive part of the praise. They were early, and had fifteen minutes or so to wait before they were admitted to the commissioner's office. 
Bloomquist spent the time adjusting his tunic, making sure that the creases in his trousers were correctly aligned, and speculating as to what the commissioner might say. He certainly won't ask me to call him Felix, he said. You're different. You're already on first-name terms with him. Just be natural, said Ulf. The commissioner's a very informal man. I'll try, said Bloomquist. When they went in, they were given a warm welcome. So you're Bloomquist, said the commissioner, shaking Bloomquist's hand. I've heard good things of you. Bloomquist beamed with pleasure. I do my best, sir. Please, said the commissioner. Call me commissioner. They sat down. Now, said the commissioner, tell me what you found out up there. Did you get to the bottom of it? Ulf nodded. We did, he said. We have an idea what's going on, and it isn't very pleasant, I'm afraid. I didn't think it would be, said the commissioner. Ulf realized that there was no avoiding this difficult situation. I'm afraid there is something abnormal about your cousin's behavior, he began. The commissioner frowned. In what respect, may I ask? Pathological behavior, said Ulf. You see, the cause of the disturbances, which are real enough, by the way, is him. He's the one causing all this, but he doesn't know about it, I think. It's a medical issue, really. The commissioner raised a hand. Hold on, Ulf, hold on. You said he. It's she. No said Ulf. Angel is not the one causing the disturbances. It's him. It's Balzer. Yes, yes, said the commissioner. But he's not my cousin. She is. Ulf swallowed hard. She? Angel? Yes, said the commissioner, smiling at the confusion. I thought I explained. She's my cousin, not him. Ulf thought hard. His task had suddenly become more difficult. Now he had to explain that the commissioner's cousin was engaged in an underhand plot, possibly criminal, to deprive her husband of his spa, all for the benefit of herself and her lover. He did his best, and the commissioner listened gravely. At the end, Ulf and Blomqvist waited while the commissioner rose from his chair and went to stand in front of the window. One thing that interests me, he said, is how you found out about my cousin's relationship with this other man, this Lillebeck person. How can you be sure they're lovers? Blomqvist intervened. We saw them together, he said, and they had no clothes on. The commissioner's eyes widened. Well, I suppose that's fairly conclusive. Actually, said Ulf, they were lying together on a... The commissioner held up a hand. Please, Ulf, spare me the details. It's just that... The commissioner interrupted him once again. You've been very frank with me, said the commissioner, and the news you've given me is not exactly palatable. No, agreed Ulf. It isn't. He had tried to make a full disclosure, but the commissioner himself had prevented him from doing so. His conscience was clear in that respect. So, what I'm facing here, the commissioner continued, is a situation where my cousin is behaving very badly and an innocent man is the victim. That's what it boils down to, doesn't it? Yes said Ulf. I think it does. What's more, the innocent man is ill. He needs help, I think. Of course he does, said the commissioner, and it behoves me, too, to deal with my cousin. Ulf looked at the floor. That's for you to decide, sir. Felix? Yes, said the commissioner. I shall, and I shall act appropriately. The commissioner was looking intently at Ulf. 
It would be most embarrassing for me if news of this were to get out, he said. There are journalists who would love this. Police commissioner's cousin in attempt to steal werewolf's spa. That sort of thing. Can't you see the headlines? Yes, said Ulf. I'm afraid I can. So it would be helpful, shall we say, for not a word of this to be breathed to anyone. Ulf inclined his head. We are very discreet, Felix. Of course you are, said the commissioner. Now he turned to Bloomquist. I gather, Bloomquist, that you have in the past requested transfer to the plain clothes department. That's correct, Commissioner, said Bloomquist. The Commissioner stroked his chin. Now let me see. How about a transfer to the Sensitive Crimes Department, Mr. Varia's unit? Will that do? It would do very well, said Bloomquist. When? Could it be with immediate effect? Of course, said the Commissioner. As of now, right now. Ulf stared fixedly at the floor. And as for you, Ulf, continued the Commissioner, we've been thinking of putting you up a rung or two on the ladder. Same job title, same office and all that, but salary increase, of course. Ulf thanked him, but there was something he needed to say. We're a bit crowded in the office, Felix. I'm not sure where we'll be able to put Bloomquist. The floor below, said the Commissioner. He can go in with the typists. I was having a look round there the other day. There's plenty of room. At least that was some relief for Ulf. He turned to Bloomquist and managed a smile. Welcome aboard, Bloomquist he said. Chapter 15 Nihil humanum mihi alienum est This is a very strange story, Dr. Svensson, said Ulf. In fact, I feel a certain embarrassment in mentioning it to you. The psychotherapist made a diffident gesture. Please don't be concerned about that, he said. Nihil humanum mihi alienum est, Mr. Varia. Nothing human is foreign to me. In other words, I suppose I've seen it all. I thought that too, said Ulf. We both see, or in your case, hear, things that would shock most people. And yet this, I do assure you, Mr. Varia, Nothing would surprise me about humanity. Nothing. But this is quite incredible. Is it? Try me. Ulf, sitting in Dr. Svensson's consulting room at the end of his regular session with the psychotherapist, began to recount Balzer's story. He did not mention his real name, nor the place, nor the connection with the commissioner, having given his word that the story would go no further. All of that was cut out. And he had explicit permission from the commissioner to find out whether anything could be done for Balzer and how that might be arranged. In his view, that permission justified this conversation. I met a man, you see, Ulf began, who looked in some respects like a wolf, Hairy hands and face, that sort of thing. Dr. Svensson listened impassively. And he had big teeth, too, said Ulf. Dr. Svensson's eyes widened slightly. We talked quite normally during the day, Ulf continued. But at night, I'm convinced we heard him howling like a wolf. Dr. Svensson took off his spectacles and polished them with his handkerchief. Very interesting, he said. And then, when I went to check up that he and his wife were all right, he seemed disheveled and a bit confused. I'm pretty sure that he had been out in the bushes, howling like a wolf. 
Dr. Svensson asked if that was all. It is, said Ulf. Dr. Svensson folded his hands. This is less unusual than you think, he said. I'm not saying that it happens a great deal, but it is something that we are aware of. You aren't telling me you believe in werewolves, said Ulf. No, said Dr. Svensson. As you know, I am a rationalist. I believe in reason and in a scientific explanation for everything. So I don't believe in werewolves. I'm glad to hear it, said Ulf. And yet I must say I was rather taken aback. If I did believe in them, which of course I don't, I can imagine myself being extremely frightened. It was the look in his eye, I think. It was extremely disturbing. Dr. Svensson nodded his agreement. Of course it was, he said. Psychotic illness is very harrowing. I remember when I first encountered it as a medical student, well before my psychiatric studies. I remember being appalled by the sheer awfulness of it, the misery. People don't necessarily know about that. Ulf listened as the psychotherapist explained the features of lycanthropy. Clinical lycanthropy is a very peculiar condition, he said. It refers, of course, to more than the belief that one is a wolf. It can include any delusional belief about being an animal of any sort. There have been cases of people believing they are cows, and there is even a very rare form of it, ophidanthropy, where you think you've become a snake. The belief can be very strong. It's no good saying to somebody, you are not a wolf, that won't work. No, no, because the point about a delusion is that you really believe it. Ulf asked about the cause. It could be hysteria or affective disorder, said Dr. Svensson. Or it could be something organic, something to do with frontal lobe or limbic system lesions. I'd be inclined to look for an underlying condition, possibly schizophrenia, possibly depression, and treat it accordingly. He paused. This poor man, will somebody help him get treatment? I think so, said Ulf. His wife's cousin is in a position to intervene. Dr. Svensson looked at Ulf. You know, Mr. Varia, your life is a very interesting one. Far more interesting than mine. Ulf sighed. Sometimes I wish it were simpler. Sometimes I wish I had a simple nine-to-five job. Do you think you'd like that? Probably not, said Ulf. I'd get bored, I suppose. I think you would, said Dr. Svensson. You need the occasions of good, as we all do, even if we don't have a name for them. I don't know what I need, said Ulf. Somebody to love, maybe. And I don't have her. Or rather, I can't have her. Dr. Svensson was gentle. Because you know it would be wrong? Yes, said Ulf, because it would be wrong. It would destroy too much. Dr. Svensson sighed. I can't tell you how many people I have had here in this consulting room, in that very chair you're sitting in, telling me about their need for love. And you can't do anything about it? I can't and nor, in many cases, can they. It would be nice, though, to be able to wave a wand and bring them the resolution they're looking for. Resolution? asked Ulf. Yes, resolution. I thought you, as a detective, would understand resolution. Your work is all about that, isn't it? Sometimes, said Ulf. But then, sometimes not. After his session with Dr. Svensson, 
Ulf returned to the office. Anna was engaged in paperwork, but was only too ready to take a coffee break. So she and Ulf went to the coffee house over the road. Their preferred table was occupied by a group of noisy students, and so they retreated to the back. So you sorted everything out? she asked. Ulf nodded. I think so. Anna knew that he was not at liberty to say much more, and she did not try to press him. But she did ask whether he had learned anything in the process. Something about lycanthropy, said Ulf, and a bit about nudists. And, oh, Saab 92s and vitamin D. That was Bloomquist's contribution. Nothing much, then, said Anna, smiling. He loved it when she made these witty understatements. He loved it so much. But then he remembered the conversation about metonyms and about not going there. He could not go there. He could not. There was forbidden territory. The apple tree in the innocent garden, except that there was a snake in the garden. There always was, whether the snake was a metonym or a real serpent. What about you? he asked. What have you been up to in the last few days? Anna sipped her coffee. She thought, I should answer, thinking about you. But she could not do that. So she said, the girls had a swimming competition. Oh, yes, said Ulf. And how did they do? They lost, said Anna. They came last. Ulf looked sympathetic. That's a pity. But then we all lose, sooner or later, don't we? We do. And at work, Ulf asked, anything happen? You won't believe this, said Anna. You won't believe it, but that boy, the one who works in the coffee bar, was reported missing by his parents. He lives at home, you see. Ulf stared at her. The shoes in the flat. So I went straight to that flat, the one where we saw the shoes. I found him straight away. And the other boy, too. Both of them? Yes. And they had no clothes on. Neither of them did. How strange, said Ulf. I told him to get dressed and go and assure his parents that he was all right. The best thing to do, said Ulf. He shook his head. Young people. We were just the same, said Anna. We didn't take our clothes off, said Ulf. Oh, not as often as they do. Oh, well, sighed Anna. No good crying over... Ulf finished the reference for her. Spilt milk, he said. They were both silent. It was time to go back to the office. Neither wanted to, but they had to. That evening, when he returned to his flat, Ulf showered, changed, and then knocked at Mrs. Herkforsch's door to collect Martin. His neighbor had been making blueberry jam, and she gave him a jar of it for his store cupboard. You spoil me, Mrs. Herkforsch, he said. And she said, You deserve it, Mr. Varia. And if a widow can't spoil a man like you, then what is there left for her to do, I ask you? He asked her about Martin's day. He's definitely on the mend, Mr. Varia, she said. There's no doubt about it. He chased a squirrel today, which is something he hasn't done for a long time. And his bark is coming back. He sounds more confident. I'm delighted to hear that, Mrs. Hergforsch, said Ulf. He took Martin out for an evening walk. He did not have to cajole him. The dog came willingly and seemed to be interested once more in the sights and smells of the park. Ulf felt happy. Martin had been away in a strange land, and now he was back. Had I been Catholic, he thought, I would have lit a candle to St. Francis in gratitude for the return of my dog. But I'm not. I don't believe in any of that, although perhaps I wish I did. 
Perhaps I would take comfort in at least parts of it. And what was wrong in believing in St. Francis, who was gentle and beloved of animals, when there was so much wrong with the world? If you can't find one sort of love, Ulf thought, then perhaps there are others out there to hand, ready to do for you what love has always done for people. Perhaps it was there. He looked down at Martin, who was trotting beside him on one of the paths in the park. You're a good dog, Martin, Ulf said. Martin, being deaf, did not hear. But then he looked up at Ulf, who on impulse said, articulating carefully and moving his lips very clearly, Wolf. He did not know why he said it, but the word just came to him. Martin gazed at him, struggling to read his master's lips against the light. But then he succeeded, and to Ulf's astonishment, the dog sat down, raised his head in the air, and howled. Ulf stood quite still. Then he bent down, patted Martin reassuringly on the head, and took him back along the path by which they had come, which is, of course, the path that you can always trust to take you back to where you belong. Bolinda hopes you enjoyed the reading of The Department of Sensitive Crimes, written by Alexander McCall Smith and read by Saul Reichlin. Our audiobooks are becoming increasingly popular among travellers, families, and people who are on the go. If you really enjoyed this audiobook, please introduce your friends and family to the experience. We're sure they'll love you for it. If you want to hear more about our fabulous range of titles, please visit us online at belinda.com. Thanks for listening, and remember to always take a Belinda audiobook with you. Audible hopes you've enjoyed this program.